G'day, Nagashai. It's AOS Coach, and we are talking all things Soul Blight Grave Lords. You got a new book. I don't know if it's new new art. I can't remember if you got new art mm-hmm. or not. Nah, I was going to say this is the Gitch treatment. You got good rules, um, yeah. but you got old art. But I am here with the Mortark of the Corsairs and uh, Corsairs. Corsairs. I'm, I'm really <laughs> Corsairs. <laughs> Corsairs, Corsairs. I'm looking at too many books. Look, I'm here with the, one of the top performing Soul Black Grave Lords player. It's Alex Gonzalez, who is a summonable hero we've recently learnt. And we're yeah, talking sure. Soul Black Grave Lords. <laughs> Glad to be on, man. Um, yeah, I love the new book. And uh, I'm definitely very excited to get a lot more reps with it. First off, welcome back, because uh, I had yeah. you on the last book, and probably a nice little segue, because obviously you got a new book, new rules, updated war scrolls, things have changed, things have improved, things have been lost. What's your overall read? Uh, not going to lie, I went into it with a lot of, I was very, very, very skeptical to see what they were going to do. Part of me thought that they were going to turn it into like a very irrelevant book. Um, it is one of the most popular books or, or armies to play in all of Age of Sigmar. So, you know, because of that, it also doesn't have like a good win percentage and things like that pretty consistently. Um, I was incredibly pleased with what they did. Um, I knew that there were things that were probably going to go away and some of those surprised me, but the amount of things that they added um, definitely made up for it. They, I, We gained more than we lost by a mile. So you are overall just happy with the book? Yeah, there's so much. I mean, even with old Legion Nagash days in 1.0, the entire army was relatively like a toolkit and now it's just... Each each time the book a new book comes out, it's just a further refined toolkit that you have. It's the army is like a multi tool. You know, Sons of Behemoth might be a hammer, just like a, you know one type of tool. You know, Gits might be another. You know, this one's kind of like a Leatherman. It was interesting because I was obviously reading this book at the same time as uh, Ossiak Bone Reapers, mm-hmm. and reading reading OBR obviously one it has a lot less War Scrolls. But two, it was very obvious where the strengths were, um, mm-hmm. super obvious. But this reminds me a lot of Cities of Sigma, where it's not the allegiance ability, it's not a particular sub-faction, it's the combinations and it's all the little things you do together to make it as powerful as it can be. So on the surface, like Cities of Sigma, you're like, eh, this is all right. And then you, when you get really into the list building and the combinations and the spells and the artifacts, it's like, right, I could build something really powerful did you feel the same way with this book or did things like just stand out to you immediately as an experienced player? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that you, the sentiment that you have now is a sentiment that I had in the previous book because there were a lot of different abilities and things you could do with war scrolls that weren't faction specific. Um, now there are a lot of wombo combos that like I used to run, for example, that are not possible anymore due to keyword restriction um for me it's more of the sub factions very subtly well in some of them it's very obvious but in others it kind of subtly guides you by the hand to try to make a list related to or the the best optimized list for those sub factions are generally going to be in a very specific range at least in my opinion there are some that have more like uh utility you know uh that we can go into later but um some of them are very like this is the one thing that they do. Others are others can perform multiple jobs. Yeah, you, you definitely feel that when you look at, uh, let's say, Avangori, for example, it kind of mm-hmm. forces you down a particular build. You look at, uh, obviously, Castellai, and it's obviously promoting, like, Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon and your Blood Knights. But then there's other ones like Legion of Blood. And even, like, it's actually interesting because when I got to Legion of Night, I'm like, ooh, this is different. Like, what are you actually trying to build me towards? Because in the past, I deep strike, I do all these crazy things. Now I'm like, what are you trying to achieve, Legion of Night? <laughs> and I'm, I don't know if I've got the answer just yet. Legion of Night is really, really interesting. Um, you know, my, I, my, my twin brother plays Warhammer now, and uh, I got him in. And uh, he's been playing some Soul Blight now as well. And he's been really thinking about Legion tonight. So I've been kind of looking over things for him, uh, you know, trying to get some lists to, for him to test out. And that one's, it's funky. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's really, really cool to have that kind of ambush mechanic 
in addition to the you know grave sites and having a heroic action to just be able to teleport and just like dip out i mean who needs tunnel master then right like yeah it'll probably be gone in a couple of months anyway but from what i'm yeah. hearing from you you like the book uh overall yeah you lost some things but overall you think it's a gain and more importantly a refinement so if you're already playing soul black grave lords consider this a refinement and a tweaking of like what you did in the past um if you're new to the faction it's always doing what it used to do just a little different <laughs> yeah exactly when uh, maybe some high level stuff and then we'll get into the weeds because it is a big book and i and for anyone who's listening alex and i are not going to go into every single war scroll <laughs> because we'll be here forever um alex has given me uh, a couple of lists so we'll kind of wrap it up at the end with a couple of lists but initially i just want to get his thinking around what's the sub factions what's the artifacts how do you like this particular book and what is it as an experienced player you're building around but is there anything that kind of stood out to you? Things that maybe weren't very good in the old book that now you're like, holy shit, this is amazing. I now need to start running this. Or maybe something you used to build around in the past. I know there's been a lot of noise from the zombie community that's mm -hmm. like, oh, zomb zombies aren't that good anymore. And <laughs> you, lost some, you lost some things. I'll give you credit. But I feel like some people have just put them in like trash tier. Z sorry, zombies, you're never coming out, which I think is a little bit harsh. Yeah, um, I was never a big zombie person. I was a big zombie dog person uh, because I mained Virkos very hard um, when I was playing them in the previous book. Um, now I'm kind of waffling between Virkos and a different sub faction, which we can, of course, get to later. Um, but uh, yeah, zombies, they, I personally didn't play them because I knew that like no game would finish on time because when you, when you play zombies, you don't play 20, you don't play 60. You play like 120 and i'm not about that i'm not going to do that at all i'm not going to touch it um but they obviously lost their mortal wounds um you know i personally think that you know zombies are best suited either to go full into that like zombies spam shenanigans with the access to like the corpse cart tax for the mortal wounds again but i actually like them best in obr um i play obr i have obr i'm not as excited about that book as i am with soul blight but um you know every time i looked at uh, at the list i thought where's the body where are the bodies and um the easiest solution was for 175 uh, 170 points getting that regiment of renown of just 20 zombies one corpse cart short can get picked out it's a character now though and boom it's got uh they both have a five award if they're within range of each other so that's helpful it's not bad considering and i'm sure someone's about to um actually me in the in the comments like oh, <laughs> OB, o, obr have no allies yes these are mercenaries these are regiments of renown they're different that's how you can get around it so but it's a, it's a good shout it's a really good shout um but okay so zombies changed a little bit um is there anything that maybe wasn't very good in the old book that you think has had a little glow up like for me for example the humble skeleton the humble skeleton when i read that war scroll and i saw some of the changes i'm like yes please oh, so good yeah um i initially looking at the book i was not happy to see that both skeletons and graveguard got their um got their attacks switched around they used to be threes to hit and then they're four and they were fours to wound now it's the opposite it's fours to hit and threes to wound but in the grand scheme of things as long as you don't get roared or you have some other buff on top of you you should be perfectly fine with hitting on threes and frankly if you're not hitting on threes you should have some other buff that we can get into again later that allows you to almost have like a mitigation of those four up um, uh, fours to hit like uh, get extra attacks if you will um i think that Skeletons definitely got a glow up uh, because now they can get rend and their regrow is more than just from the things that were died that phase. I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, but I also think uh, Black Knight's got a big glow up, uh, big, big, big glow up. Um, mm. And then I think that the some of the lesser generic heroes got a glow up. And when I say lesser ge generic, I'm really just talking about both White Kings. Um, and then the biggest... Um, 
The biggest one for me is actually more of a flavor choice. Um, I've always enjoyed the Vingorian Lord. Um, I never liked the model per se. So I've always like converted and stuff like that. And I'm a little, I'm a little fiend. I'm a little goblin for getting like old school models. So if you ever remember, if you, if you ever played Warhammer Fantasy, the Zacharias, the ever living model, the, um, Ooh, you know, the, the yes. dragon, it's a zombie the, dragon. The, the, Nick, the, the Nick Croc um, vampire. It fits on a it fits on a Vingorian base perfectly. Um, if you buy it from the Age of Sigmar days, it comes with the appropriate base. Um, and I swapped Zacharias. I uh, custom built a uh, a saddle and I put a Blood Knight, um, an old yeah Blood Dragon Vampire Lord on top with a pike. And that's been my Vingorian Lord. He's been collecting dust. And the Vingorian Lord, in my opinion, got a gigantic glow up uh, with more consistent attacks, less. Um, randomness with not being able to do anything for like bloodlust or whatever uh i think that that thing got a giant glow up yeah i i would agree um that that to me like the minute i saw both is it luca vi and the vangorian lord mm -hmm. lost their lost that ability like in the hero phase you roll the dice they go crazy and they can mm -hmm. run and charge but they can't use certain things that consistency is a tournament player chef's kiss i absolutely love it um, but it wasn't all like sunshine and rainbows, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Manfred. Manfred lost these little teleport shenanigans. He can't yeet out of combat. Um, like there's so many little micro changes and the way the white King kind of interacts, um, uh, like I mentioned, you know, those little minor heroes like Torvus and, uh, Gorslav. I'm like, Ooh, I'm now kind of interested in those. Like they never really interested me in the past. Now they've caught my attention. Yeah, they, they they each have gotten very unique. I'll say, um, and I'm familiarizing myself with Manfred again. Uh, Manfred didn't necessarily get like a debuff. He just lost his like very explicit kind of benefit of, of being able to dip out whenever he wanted. Um, being able to do an out of sequence like charge and being in Legion of Night is super duper helpful. Um, he got extra attacks for his sword and I believe for his glaive as well. Um, but I'm double checking that right now. Um, but, he did, but he did lose his command ability. It used to give you plus one to hit and plus one to wound aura. So that's true. He did lose that, which is really, really unfortunate. And it was just one extra attack with a sword. Um, but he gets the War Master ability, which is really, really helpful. Um, and FYI, though, unlike OBR, um, which uh, have two, three War Masters, two of which are faction specific. Uh, none of the War Masters and Soul Black Grave Lords are faction specific. Granted, they're not going to be nearly as useful if they're not in their own sub faction, but none of them are faction specific. Um, the Sword of Unholy Power, I think, has a lot more very explicit verbiage, which I enjoy. Um, and the fact that he has, uh, he can give strike first or he has strike first when he makes a charge, I think kind of makes up for the dip in combat because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if he gets alpha, he gets alpha. But uh, I think it's more of a lateral move than it is him getting nerfed. I think it's just we were looking we're looking at him and he was you know blue and now he's orange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not saying Manfred got nerfed. I'm saying yeah. he got changed. So sure. And like, <laughs> but you but you make a good point. And the fact is that yeah, he might have changed, but he's still viable. I think is what mm -hmm. I'm hearing. Yeah. I'm going to ask a question that came from Discord and then I'm going to bring up the rules because we are getting into the weeds, which is what I wanted anyway. Um, and I want to get your kind of your opinion and your thoughts around uh, the different rules. But a question that came up from Discord, which I thought was a really good one coming from a guy called, uh, well, a person called Nagash Apologist saying, <laughs> what, are the what are the archetypes you think have the longest longevity in the new book? Uh, recursion. Um, you know, being able to have a, an being able to be that person where you're going to be able to get hit and be able to take a punch and get right back up. That's the mechanic that's always existed. And um, that's that archetype is further reinforced in this new book because um, even in 1.0, uh, now granted half of 1.0, no death army had a book, but when legions and the gash came out, um, you recycled at the end of the movement phase, um, you could still make a charge and now you can't, but you could do that. And then, 
with this new with a, the book before this, you know, it was the end of the turn. So they're bringing a lot of things back into line with the a very, very, very first book that wasn't actually called Soul Blight Gravelords, but for all in, all intents and purposes, it was. Um, so they have been able to kind of like keep this very, very, very consistent theme. Um, and they've changed it in a few ways. I mean, I was a little disappointed to see that uh, the generic spell that every caster knew, um, which was de Deathly Invocation, to just bring, you know, three models back to a unit, that's gone. But now um, the Deathly Invigoration of just bringing things back in the hero phase is a flat three. And if it's near, if the unit's near a grave site, it's plus one. And if you're near a Mortis Engine, which is good, <laughs> I think it's good. It's not, it shouldn't spam them, I don't think, but they're incredibly good. Um, uh, uh, if you're near that as well, then you bring uh, seven models back, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And if you really want to bring back models as well, obviously, we'll, we'll talk about Nagash and I will get your opinion on Nagash in due time. Mm -hmm. Because he yeah. did get a, I, I I will say he got a glow up on his war scroll, but he also got a glow up in the point. So we'll talk a bit about later what yeah. your thoughts are with Nagash. Is it worth it? What would you need if it wasn't worth it? Um, there's a lot of really cool changes, and I think Soul Blight Grave Lords is a list builder's dream. It's like a really nice delight because you can do so many things. And look. Whether you want to run Blood Knights, whether you run Zombies, Skeletons, what, uh, you want to run Black Knights, there's something in here for you. And look, when we talk competitive, there's going to be some optimum choices. But if you do want to run some type of list, I feel like you could, you know, th there is a build for everyone. Unless you like shooting. <laughs> yeah, then, then there's not much you can do there. There's some random shooting, but not much. Yeah. No, although, although some people, I remember seeing some rumors like, oh, they're going to get skeleton crossbows. Yeah, that didn't happen. Literally Sorry. never going to happen. Never going to happen. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. But in fairness, like, look at those Nighthawk crossbows. Like, maybe you don't want them. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, All right. So, so so we'll skip the Cursed Legions, uh, this, the Cursed Bloodlines, because we'll get to the proper rules uh, down the track. But when you look at the sub the the allegiance abilities, you got the endless legions, the unquiet dead, deathly invocation, and deathless minions. As an experienced player, what do you see? How do you think about this for your list construction? Like, talk to me. I assume everyone's read the book, or they've at least listened to me read the book to them. Um, what does this all mean to you? Is there stuff here you build around? So this is actually really great that you bring this up because uh, I was actually in your servers, uh, in your channel um, yesterday, uh, kind of answering a very similar question um, in a different channel. I, I play Corn too, um, and uh, someone was asking me questions about lists, and um, I I just kind of come to, came down and said, you know, everything needs to have a purpose. When you build a list, um, you need to go, okay, why is this unit in that list? Um, is it a meme list? Because I have written the list that has, uh, you know, 12 court, uh, night guard, the, the zombie ogres. I've done it. It's, it's looks fun. It's dumb, but warmer is dumb. <laughs> um, you know, so, uh, you really, really need to have an idea of what you're going to bring in your list. Uh, especially if you're just starting out in the game. Like, I think that everything needs to have a tool. Um, or a purpose rather uh with these allegiance abilities i mean this all just goes fully into it kind of very smoothly blends into the faction um you know i had mentioned deathly invocation just a moment ago but just the fact that you can just re uh, you know bring more models back to units and it's consistent it's not d3 anymore really really um helps benefit the idea of bringing summonable units on the table and like you mentioned earlier since there are summonable heroes now um, you could heal three wounds on a summonable hero. You know, you could bring uh, two units, uh, you, two graveguard units can get three graveguard back, and that one wound white king is now a four wound white king. Like that's pretty helpful. Um, the unquiet dead uh, is is you know, very consistent as well. Really, there haven't been a lot of changes. There's just minor tweaks. I would say the biggest change in all the allegiance abilities. Is the fact that Deathless Minions is now a flat six-up save, which we all knew were was coming after seeing 
the White Dwarf update for Feck and Night Haunt's Battle Tome, you know, we knew that Death Armies were probably leaning in this direction of not being wholly within a hero. So it does make things be a little bit more of an independent agent um, if they need to, rather than the traditional way of playing Death Armies, even all the way back in Warm of Fantasy of just like hugging and clinging to your heroes. You don't have to do that if you don't want to or need to. All right, so let me ask you some follow-up questions. So Deathless sure. Minions, right? The old Deathless Minions, you ha- it was based around an aura from heroes. Now it's just every Grave- Soul Black Grave Lords unit has a six-up ward. Yeah. Has that changed the amount of heroes, um, the way that you use the army? Does, does that change alone? Because um, I will go to Deathly Invocation in a second, but does that does that change anything at all? Not much. I'll be honest. It just gives you the ability. It, it doesn't really interact with the heroes as much as it just interacts with the other things, you know? So now if you have, again, Night Guard, or, or I mean, Night Guard actually don't care either way. They have a five-up ward. But if you have um, Fear Ghost Bloodborne, or if you have um, like maybe Black Knights uh, or Zombie Dogs that need to go out of reach, they need to maybe tie something up, um, you're not taking a big risk. Um, or if something is like a unit of skeletons, for example, if they're hitting the, if they're on their home objective, while well, everything else, all of your hammers are going into your opponent's front line, and you know that there's maybe a couple of deep strikers that are nearby, you don't have to worry about being holding near uh, a grave site or holding near a hero to benefit from the six up ward. You just know you're going to have it now. So it gives you a little bit more ease of play um, and that kind of fire and forget. Well, it's not going to be a fire forget, but come you know going from one book to the other i think it's going to be a big relief for players not having to worry about that you won't need to rely on power pairs just to keep deathless uh, minions or any other but it doesn't mean that you throw away all your heroes because with deathly no. invocation you need at least three so i guess well you don't need three but um each hero phase you can pick three soul black grave lord summonable units within like blah 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 when you look at Deathly Invocation and knowing that Invigorating Aura has changed, um, do you like to take a lot of small heroes? Do you go for a couple of big heroes? Like, what's your thinking around Deathly Invocation and how you try to maximize that particular ability? Uh, well, you know, this, unfortunately, uh, in the next few months with the new season, things are going to change, of course. Um, right now, um, you know, time stamped. Uh, it, I would usually only bring maybe one, maybe two Galatian champions um, to try to benefit from maybe backline abilities while you have some more heavy hitter um, um, heroes a little bit more in the front. Um, but the fact that you can have, I, I would only really have one or two small small heroes unless you're playing Fearcos for a very, very specific reason. But uh, for the most part, I think that you're usually most armies in in in, in AOS are going to have anywhere between eight to twelve units. So you know when you think about how many heroes, how many things can be affected, not very many, especially when you have very large like you know if you have a zombie if you have a zombie dragon, that alone is going to mean that like you're not going to have fourteen units. You shouldn't at least, um, and so you have maybe three or four heroes in your list. I think you're fine. Um, you know, the previous book, I, I really don't think it's unchanged uh, when it comes to that because I'm thinking of my list from before and I had a, around, you know, no more, no less than three, no more than maybe five, five heroes. I generally ran around three to four in my previous list. So I don't think it's that much of a change. Yeah, like, I guess there's a couple of things. Like, and obviously this is where the archetype and the builds are going to change. Like, for example, sure. if I run a zombie heavy list, I'm going to need keeping 60 zombies wholly within 12 can be difficult. So I might sure. have a hero following. You know, if I'm throwing Graveguard up, you might have the Vampire Lord or the White King. Um, but what I'm hearing is that you still want to have a couple of heroes. Um, you don't want to lean in necessarily to all the heroes. Um, because you still need the troops. Yeah, but I will say, um, and this is something that you broached the subject a little earlier, um, there are abilities on heroes that still require range and are still going to be really important, whether it's a spell, whether it's, um, you know, the Graveguard, uh, you know, the two White Kings, one of them is just, uh, you know, pick a unit 
and they have our graveyard unit exploding sixes to hit they got to be holy within 12 to do that in the hero phase or you have to be holy within 12 of a white king for fellow black knights to not only get reroll charges but also do fours to more or roll four ups for mortal wound impact hits rather than five ups which by the way is fantastic just chef's kiss that that unit that combo that's a wombo combo that is very good i was so happy to see the black knights get a glow up and then a reason to take the the uh, white king on steed because i'm like yes this is the power pair that i've been waiting for oh yeah and the fact that you can just keep them both in the grave be nine inches away and get those reroll charges is is very sexy um it's fun Speaking of the grave, nothing really changed with the grave sites. Is there anything that you would like? You mentioned the Black Knights being from the grave sites. Is there any other interesting interactions you've noticed that I'm just trying to think? Has anything been added to the army that would now encourage you to start them in the grave site as opposed to on the table? I don't think there's any new rules when I'm thinking about it. Well, you'd want to do it because of the Grave Guards reroll charge ability. But yeah, you wouldn't keep them in the grave. You, you wouldn't keep them on the table. You would put them in the grave because of that reason. Um, in my, at least in my opinion, because then you can do the reroll charges relatively easily. Um, you know, uh, being able to reroll a nine inch charge is gigantic. It really, really ups your chances of possibly making that charge. Um, and being able to have multiple threats on the table, if it list dependent, you could potentially have a really really big hammer let's say your opponent measured you went straight up to the front of the line and a mission like position over power and you're going right into his face with a couple of things you can have something come up from a grave site a grave i mean a unit of white uh, a white king on steed in addition to a unit of 10 black knights or two units of five and now you're just really really getting the ability to do a lot of mortal wounds and impact hits and like tag your opponent in their side uh especially if you if they make you go first or if you choose to go first um it's a little bit of a risk but like you know that can also be something that you can also do later in the game i went on a little tangent in my head because one of the, yeah. lo- the rule one of the rules i absolutely love is the zombie dragon can now come in from reserve not the not the the mounted zombie dragon but the old regular zombie dragon can yes. come in from reserve that was where my mind went to i'm like oh yeah, there's no other yeah. combinations but the bloody zombie dragon i don't know if it's enough for me to take it but i just love the mm. idea you know i was actually just thinking about that earlier today and i was talking to my brother about that um for his legion and night list i was actually talking about um you know, he wasn't going to be able to possibly fit a zombie dragon and a vampire lord on zombie dragon at the same time. But the deep strike that they get and the fact that the zombie dragon, the terror geist, um, uh, uh, vampire lord on zombie dragon and uh, Prince Vordry, they all have terrify now, which is great. That was like a, a rule that <laughs> like Seraphon have on the Carnosaur. Like now it's just a rule that they, you know, that zombie dragons get as well. Not being able to do inspiring presence within three inches is really, really big, especially if they're in a unit or fighting against something that won't just immediately die to them. Um, so having the zombie dragon, a regular one in either Avangori for obvious reasons or either, or even Legion of Night, but paired with a Vangorian Lord to just for free get the hunger ability is really really useful i love that i i was i yeah. was thinking about it in avangori um yeah there's just so, so many cool changes there's so many cool changes in this book yeah and speaking of avangori uh luca vi she had it's so funny she just like her spell changed from being one type of jank to a different type of jank right so like especially as a corn player i was bummed to see the um you know the corn demon prince go away with his no, you know, half uh, runs and charges within like 18 inches. And then Luke of Ice still had that as a spell, but for within 12 inches of her. So I was like, okay, you know, at least Soul Blight still have something like that. And then in the new book for Corn, they lost the six inch pile and six inch activate. And Luke of I keeps that for friendly, like zombie dragon and terror guys near her or wholly within 24 inches of her, which is just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many cool things. There's so many cool things. Um, one other rule I just want to quickly talk about on this page is sure. the the Endless Legions. And 
the changes, obviously, there's a couple of changes. The one that I want to call out the most is the summonable hero chain. So previously, as you mentioned, um, you could never revive a hero, a summonable hero. So that's your White King. Is it Kritza? Kritza is a summonable hero? Yeah. Yeah. I think that I get why they did that, but I don't like it. So Kritza used to be um, at the end of each movement phase, yours and your opponents on a four up, he comes back. Um, now he can only ever come back once. And so he's less like a Scar Blood Wrath, and he's more just, I don't know, a worse White King for slightly less points. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's him. It's it's both White Kings, the one on foot, yes. the one that's mounted, and it's Kritza. I don't believe any other uh, character. No. Has it. No, I don't oh, think there's oh. any. Sons of Elmorn. The oh. War Cry. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the Underworld white king and his buddies he's got summonable oh oh i think i missed mm. that one i think i missed that one yeah check him out it's oh, actually okay. they're really useful because there's um it's what 220 points for four models in uh, in the gang uh the big guy's got four uh wounds so it's like eight wounds worth of grave guard and then it's a white king that gives a free command point to that gang as well um but loses the other white king ability and it's all wrapped up so basically it's a white king plus 85 points of 10 essentially eight grave guard not not that you needed this confirmation but i'm just looking at the war scroll and yes a thousand percent um the king uh volmon does have the summonable keyword so um <laughs> yeah this is just just want to reconfirm it so that the comment mm -hmm. section didn't go crazy but what are your thoughts on the Endless Legions in general? Because you used to come back at the end of the Battle Shock phase, and my poor opponents, I've got a guy in my local community, Tom, I play a lot. The guy has never rolled a Deathless Legion in his <laughs> life against me. But now it seems that it's improved, it's easier to bring back. Um, and it's happening in the movement phase, not in the Battle Shock phase, which I thought was a big win. Yeah, um, I I do agree that it is a pretty big win that it is kind of in the middle of the turn. It really makes your opponent think um, because there, it's not the end of the turn. You guys aren't scoring points and it's going to about to be, you know, a roll for priority or it's about to be the other player's turn. You guys know, you know, it's it's kind of like more of a, disrupt, a disruption for your uh, opponent, maybe um, morally on the other side of the table. But um I don't really like the fact that they can't charge and they basically can't do anything. They're just there. They exist. Nothing else when they come onto the table like that, um, which is unfortunate, but I understand why there's only so many things you can do without, you know, pushing the boundary of being a little too strong. Um, so they they played it really, really safe with this games workshop did, which is fine. Um, but I do like the idea that things are easier to, to come back. Um, you know, a, Three up in your turn, basically. Uh, four up in your opponent's turn for normal units. Otherwise, it's a four up and a five up for these characters. Um, and the verbiage of recycling things is a lot more explicit because there used to be a lot of hubbub about, you know, if a zombie if a zombie unit dies and they come back from the gravesite, can Korslov also bring a unit in? You know, and now there's just no like, no questions, no kind of. To like I have I have a question here. It's just very very plain, which I really appreciate Game Workshop's been doing. It's cleaner because it used to be like on a five up. Then with these conditions, it would go down to like, and obviously in the right in the right com combination, you could get it to like two or three. Um, sure. But yeah. now, but now it's just flat four. Obviously plus one, um, which is great. Mm hmm. I'm I'm a big fan of it. I think that overall it is going to be more consistent, um, especially if you start losing things in the first turns. Like if you get alpha really hard, you're probably going to get some units back, and your opponents, if they're if they've alpha you, they probably aren't controlling the objectives that you can plop your guys on top of. So um, super duper helpful. Yeah. Um, anything else you talk about with the allegiance abilities? Um. Well, I guess one more thing uh, with with endless legions, there is a really, really, really big change too with that. With the fact that um, not only in the previous book you could only set up units from endless legions wholly within twelve of a gravesite. Um, in the book before that, again, going with that theme, what's old is new again. Um, you could bring it in from a gravesite, or you could bring it in from a hero. And being able to have that flexibility 
is incredibly powerful i think you know because now um especially since there's a grand strategy that becomes very e very very kind of the one to pick for soul blight your opponents usually if they have the ability to to do so they're going to try to swarm your grave sites um, not only for to prevent your grand strategy but to also prevent your recursion now you don't have to worry about that as long as you aren't like completely getting decimated and you still have heroes assuming you're not being decimated they should always be somewhere that you can bring back bodies um exactly and and when you go to like putting down your four grave sites keep that in mind have like an emergency grave site where at worst case scenario you're going to be able to bring something back mm -hmm. actually yeah. speaking of that how do you like to place your grave sites do you have a like Ooh. a rough rough thought uh, obviously every battle and every mission and every opponent is going to be different but do you have like a rough recommendation for someone getting started with putting down their grave sites yeah um the easiest way i would explain it is to try to be where the objectives are not um you know if you kind of let's say the um let's say the objectives are if you see the triangle here let's say the, the oh boy uh you know what imagine the two objectives uh, let's say i'm the center of the board <laughs> and uh there's one objective here there's one objective here and there's two on the sides, right? You're gonna to wanna to put yours like a square to the diamond, you know, or vice versa. Um, I think that's the easiest course of action to have good spread. And usually, of course, that might change depending on what um, uh, what the territories look like since you have to put two in your territory. But uh, there are some games where, you know, you might know the matchup, you might know the player, and you might wanna be like, cool, I'm gonna put one like right in the middle of their deployment zone. And I know, I know that person, and I know that they're going to babysit that uh, gravesite now because they don't want they don't want to the field they don't want the the bad touch you know so yeah there's a lot of good uh, strategy involved with gravesites but generally I do like to play it pretty evenly unless I know who I'm playing yeah I'll I'll always think about not necessarily the point but the 12 inch aura to make sure that I try to be able to bring back bodies. And when I do bring back bodies, I'm maximizing how many I can bring back as opposed to my opponent screened half of the grave site and I can only bring back half a unit or I just flat out can't bring it back. Oh yeah. I, I would never recommend putting a, a grave site too close to a board edge for that same reason. You want as much spread as possible for, you know, essentially, especially if you have like those, um, those real thin objective markers, you know, the little plastic ones, the ones that hit the whole side, like if for a soul blight player, a really, really, really good idea to visualize it for themselves. It, uh, if you have extras and you have your five, four or five objectives on the table and you have extras, pull that out and look across the map and just look at mm -hmm. it and be like, cool, these are my grave sites. These are the zones, you know? I always like when I deploy, for example, um, I'll get like a nine inch stick or a 12 inch stick, measure it away from the, the deployment zone and then like push it out a little further just to make sure I've got a threat. I may not bring it out, but it's always mm. the threat that I could and my opponent will leave units to screen or they'll leave it open for me to take advantage. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, making your opponent think very hard about their moves and their deployments can be very useful for Soul Blight. All right, this is a massive book. So I think what we're going to do is a bit, a bit of rapid fire because we'll be here till Christmas um, and we are <laughs> recording it. We are recording in April. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, um, this is pre FAQ and errata. So things can change, points can change, rules can change. We're doing our best with what we know if you're listening to us in the future. Spells. Do you have any favorite spells, any ones that have stood out to you, or even any combinations? Like I always take Vol Transference on my Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon as an example. Yeah. What are your thoughts? And because by the way, not only did you lose spells, but mm -hmm. you also changed the uh the nine up rule. What was it called? The um you know when you uh, Locus is Shyish. That's mm -hmm. changed a yeah. lot. So I really like this. Um, and yeah, the Locus of Shias just went away. Instead of that even existing, there's just explicit things that happen on each spell, as we can see here, um, that you know, when you roll an unmodified nine up, this is what happens, um, which I think is a lot more cut and dry, which I don't mind. I don't mind that. Sometimes I think that that can get a little too, too uh, like, I don't know, lazy. But I think in this instance, especially with such a massive book, 
I have no problem at all. Um, I really, really like, I've always liked, um, especially with uh, running Mortarks, uh, Fading Vigor, always consistent. Um, and uh, one of my favorite changes with th that Lore of Death Mage is this Waste Away. Um, there used to be a, a spell called uh, Decrepify, and it only affected enemy heroes. And when I used to run like a Manfred Neferata combo, uh, Manfred would always have Fading Vigor as a chosen spell, Neferata would always have Decrepify. And it was the exact same rule as Waste Away, um, but it was hero only. Now you can pick anything you want to get uh, hit with Waste Away, which is minus one to wound and minus one to damage. Um, now, unfortunately, you can't double up on the same unit like you could before. There was a time where I fought against a Suns player and there was a Gatebreaker running up to me and, you know, I double Fading Vigored and double Waste Away or double Decrepify at the time, uh, the thing. And I just, I, at that point, I just felt safe to just charge it with anything, you know, because at that point, the, uh, with the Neferata combo, that, that Gatebreaker was minus one to hit, minus one to wound, minus two damage. And minus two attacks. I was like, oh, I'm totally okay with like 10 zombies charging this thing. And that's it. Um, but uh, yeah, really, really like Waste Away. Um, Vile Transference, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I never, ever ran that in a pre in a previously. But now that like the hunger is a little bit of a sexier role for vampires, but it caps at six. Uh, Vial Transference is a lot more tasty for me as a choice. Um, and on top of that, uh, Spirit Gale. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Spirit Gale, which was never one that I really liked at all in the previous book. Uh, now that it's a board wide, it used to be just all enemy units within 12 inches take a mortal wound. Now it's just board wide take a mortal wound. And if you roll a night up, take two. That is massive, especially against buff characters. You know, nothing can hide from that. And I think that that is so strong. Um, you know, imagine New Seraphon, right? Um, with Slon, with, with New Croak, things like that. It's like, cool. Well, now not only is the Slon taking a mortal wound that he's going to have to pass on to the Saurus Guard, but now the Saurus Guard is taking a mortal wound as well. And if it's two mortal wounds each, Saurus Guard potentially taking four mortal wounds instead. Like, just these body, it help, it, it's good against bodyguard mechanics. It's good against buff characters. It's good against everything. Have you noticed the difference with your spell choices? Because you used to have six in each of the spell laws, mm -hmm. and I've forgotten some of the ones you used to have. I know, like, Decrepify was one I always used to run. Is it, over, uh, is it over, Overwhelming Dread? Overwhelming dread? dread. There was, yeah, there's a couple of spells that would always be the foundational ones that I took, but I noticed it's like, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed, like, that impact in your, in your latest games? No. <laughs> um i almost don't even you know i almost didn't remember them until this conversation i had to think about them again um it it is so helpful the uh, that the lore of vampires actually has useful abilities that i've not needed to or I've, i haven't even thought of doing um some of the previous spells um the one that i think personally i would as i play more games probably miss would be um uh, amaranthine pinions which is yes. just add six inches to the uh, move of a friendly vampire uh, to make a vampire lord go from six inches to 12 inches of the fly. That was always helpful. Um, and to make a zombie dragon be a 20 inch move instead, always helpful. Granted, if you're playing, if you're playing Legion of Blood and you know, you know what the priority might look like, you're not really going to care about that anyways in most missions. But um, yeah, that's probably the only one I'm going to think about. You had to like top three the spells here in mm. both, 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 both laws. Obviously, there's only three on each. What are your favorite three? Oh, yeah, that's super easy. Uh, Spirit Gale, Waste Away, Fading Vigor. Um, in order, I would say Spirit Gale number three, Fading Vigor at number two, and Waste Away at number one. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Although, Prison, Prison of Grief is singing to me, being able to make an opponent strike last. That's just singing to me. Yeah, no, no, I, I totally agree. So that's actually my favorite thing is the fact that all of them are useful now. You know, there was one where you would like, I, I think Prison of Grief used to be like, you would grasp a piece of terrain and like on a five up, your opponent couldn't do anything near the piece of terrain. It was so like, it was, it was never. 
was it half movement or something? I, I remember you're right. There was something yeah. weird, and I couldn't remember the interaction. It was too too complicated to set up. Yeah, and it was just kind of lame. So now they just basically just um, they've condensed things. They've they've concentrated the spell lore, and they've just made all of them useful. Um, but I think it just depends on how you want to run uh, your list and kind of like what your expectations are on the spells you're going to cast and quite frankly, who's going to cast them because there are incredibly strong war scroll spells too that like you need to take into account. And then especially on like an explicit hammer unit, like um, in Legion of Blood, a Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, or even possibly a Vangorian Lord, being able to choose flaming weapons can be a huge boon instead. So... Before we move off spells, I do want to talk about a spell that significantly changed, but it's not a part of this list. Where are you going with this one? Which one? Is it Van Hells? Yeah, yeah, Van Hells. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a line in the sand. I love new Van Hells. Being able to fight in the hero phase as opposed to twice in the combat phase, to me, was awesome. As a daughter's a cane player who knows the value of fighting in a hero phase, getting out of all that all that defenses and particular buffs and being able to stop opponents, I love it. What's your take? Oh, exactly. Uh, I completely agree. Um, I I don't have it in front of me right now. Is it still casting value six? Uh, keep keep going. It, I'll, I'll I'll go find it. Okay. But, I wouldn't um, be shocked I, if it was casting value seven now or something due to due to the uh, nature of the change. Six, no, no, six, six. No, it's uh, casting value of six, range eighteen. Fantastic. Um, yeah. I, I love that one. I think it's super helpful. I mean, before it was kind of like, a, um, oh, if I have a Necromancer, then maybe my Graveguard get to activate twice if they don't just get nuked by the thing that they've already... They either... It, it would almost never matter because if I had a Necromancer, which was a big F, um, I either deleted the things I hit so I didn't have to worry and there was no second, uh, second activation or I wouldn't hit very hard or I kind of like... Uh, my, my eyes were too big for my stomach and then all of a sudden they respond back to me and they just wipe that unit or severely disable it and so my second activation either doesn't happen or doesn't matter so yeah being able to um have the ability to just immediately attack in the hero phase especially now that i've got like corn reps under my belt holy crap like with soul blight that is so good whether it's grave guard or even just the ability to do extra pylons with with uh, dire wolves uh with that can be like the possibilities are pretty much endless yeah yeah because because it's just summonable so obviously your zombies your dire wolves your um grave guard your skellies your black knights your white uh, kings your oh white and King, yeah the virkos watch captain guy is also summonable i did check him earlier yeah, yeah. sick the sick. skeleton so i'm a big yeah. fan i'm a big fan of the new necro um he's so cool Mm -hmm. yeah thanks for entertaining me on that one because i'm like oh that's a big I, I thought that was a big change because it was like a everyone runs van hales everyone loves running a little necromancer with hat um now you've got a whole bunch of allegiance abilities uh, between the different cursed bloodlines or whatever it was um mm -hmm. without going into the weeds of it all sure what's your what's your thoughts on legion of blood oh just at a very is... high level yeah. So, you know, you know who, uh, you know, one of my good friends, Jeremy, he plays a lot of the armies I play nowadays. And, uh, you know, he loves his Legion of Blood. And in the previous book, he was big Legion of Blood stand. And I was kind of like, I get it. I see it. You know, that's valid. I like Virkos. And I still do. I still really like it, whether it's the aesthetic, whether it's the, the rules. Um, big, 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 big fan. But now uh, they got me playing Legion of Blood because these abilities, these rules, which again, like you said, you know, we don't have to go through because they're right here. They are so, so useful. Like just the unparalleled expertise is just to me a cooler, radder version of like the equivalent that like ogres get, you know? So like if the hero's not in combat, he's a good cat. They're, they're a consistent caster. If they're in combat, then they're way scarier in combat now. You know, being able to make a zombie dragon, you know, four attacks at the lance, uh, four attacks at the maw, and eight attacks for the claws. Like, oh, so good. Like, you know, or the Vangorian Lord having four attacks with his uh, Gordren's Talons, which, by the way, got a, like, 
200% glow up compared to the previous version of that weapon. Like there's just so much usefulness in this army. Yeah. And, and the, and anyone who saw the white dwarf where this got introduced, you had to choose whether they got one or the other. Now you get both, which is brilliant. Really? Yeah, so so when White Dwarf brought in the Legion of Blood ability, this this particular unparalleled expertise, yeah. you had to pick. You had to pick whether your vampire mm. was uh, empowered or yeah. So so, but and obviously, if, if you were on foot, you get like two, and if you were on a vampire, on, on you're right. Dragons, no, only yeah. One. I don't know why I forgot about that. That was in the previous book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's mm. it's a great little ability. Um. Maybe maybe before I get your favorite command traits and artifacts, um, do you think I have to run Neferata in a Legion of Blood army? Like, is that like a, a must auto include or can I run a list without her? Yeah, you should be considering your army list at 1,610 points um, because you're going to want to add Neferata always. Um, you know, the usefulness that she gets, she gives you in the list is massive um again she's a vampire hero so she benefits from unparalleled, unparalleled expertise and she's a level two caster um and she has especially if you don't have any necromancers in your list she is your consistent laura death mage caster um i i can tell you even at that um all of last like itc season and stuff like that being able to uh use my command points and then have like immediately was useful but also like i would almost never have command points throughout the actual round because i would almost always especially with neferata and manfred together you know use both their command abilities and have their auras now neferata's aura is just an aura right like boom don't even have to worry um her d6 heal instead of d3 became one of the most insane rules i think i've ever read in age of sigmar so or since like 1.0 where whoever had the longest beard you know got a benefit you know but um yeah neferata's legion or um uh mortar blood ability is incredibly powerful uh mission dependent of course uh and i really really think that it's going to be something that you're going to see a lot of people play um but it's going to be something where i can see you have to think about it because if you aren't like a one drop list, then you might suffer from it. Um, I personally don't think you should be a one drop list in this army, but um, there's just so much usefulness, especially compared to, um, or when, when you're looking at Ferrata and all the rest of the battle traits, it's just, yeah, I'm rambling, but, very no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm a massive fan of Neferata. I think, and yeah, like the her bubble now doesn't cost a command point. But speaking of command points, you look at that immortal um, uh, majesty, and you, when you use this heroic action, making your opponent spend two command points to issue all that defense and inspiring presence, that's brutal. And yes. then, as you mentioned earlier, some of your units now having the new terror ability forcing opponents to not be able to use inspiring presence in general. So they, if they can't use all that defense or spending extra resources and then they run away if, uh, if they, they can't use inspiring presence. So mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. It's so useful. And you got to also remember that like Neferata could get pre uh, premeditated bloodshed. So, you know, she, um, she got, I think an extra attack on her, or she's going to get an extra attack with all of her attacks in combat. And then on top of that, they're going to be plus one, or I mean, they're going to ignore ward saves. That is going to be massive, like just straight up very strong. If I was going to run a Legion of Blood army, what would be your favorite command trait and uh, artifact, if any? Maybe you go universal artifacts, but do you have a favorite um, command trait and artifact from, from Blood? Uh, good question. I mean, I think that they're all useful, but when it, when I can, when it comes down to it, some of them are going to be irrelevant against other armies. Um, and that I always think of sons, right? Like a good kind of litmus test for um, how well you can do at a tournament is like, can you beat a gatebreaker army? I mean, I, I mean, a, a gatekeeper army, <laughs> which might be all gatebreakers, um, you know? So uh, being able to think about like an army that can like be a, a, a kingmaker, like, like sons um, at a tournament, being able to like beat something like that can be really helpful. Um, so that being said, 
Uh, my favorite is Doom Minions, but I know that if I go up against a Suns player, it's going to be completely irrelevant if they don't have baby mm. uh, Gargants because you can't pick a... Oh, no, it is going to be re- irrelevant across the board because mm. you can't pick a hero, you can't pick a monster. Um, so that's fine, but in almost any other matchup, you're going to have a lot of success besides maybe Frost Lord Spam, like Boulderhead. Um, it might not be as helpful, but for me... The grand scheme of things, Doom Minions just seems like such a powerful trait for, you know, everything from your zombie dragon with the fours to hit on the mount um, uh, or Grave Guard with fours to hit normally or even skeletons like before. Just them all hitting on twos against something. Incredibly helpful. Um, but I could also see a lot of play with Taylor Downfall. Um, I think that that could be really, really useful too. But it all requires you to have a very mobile very hard to kill uh general which like further reinforces the idea of bringing something like a vingorian lord or a zombie dragon who have you know who are monsters who have good saves who are fast and who can stay in combat yeah if i'm taking a legion of blood army i'm never just leaving home with nephi i do want to have some type of monster hero that goes in parallel like the vampire mm-hmm. lord, zombie dragon like the vingorian lord um, mm-hmm. I think to to your point, if I'm going to a tournament, uh, the tailored downfall is probably the one that'll get you the most value. Everyone has that killy hero. Um, while as you said, like Game Hunter or Doom Minions, you run the risk of um, the gauntlet of going up against armies that don't meet the criteria. Yeah. And and no, you're totally right. Like I personally would run Doom Minions, but also like I can play without a command trait and I, sh- and I could be fine. You know, for uh, there could be situations where um, a command trait can be very, very important for somebody. And so um, Taylor Downfall, I think, is probably my, my second favorite. Um, I Just like before, just like the Spell Lords, I like them all. And it's like a problem where I got to choose the favorite of the ones I already like. What about the artifacts? Oh, dude. Um, because of the fact that you need uh, a hammer like general you personally you got to pick the cloak of mist of shadows um having a three up uh ignoring ward saves it uh frees up neferata from having to cast her spell uh, her war scroll spell of ignore modifiers or ignore negative modifiers for save um but it just allows you to be a lot more safe with your zombie dragon or your vangorian lord or hell even your white king if you choose to make it that instead so just having that three up save that can't be rendered or I mean can't be modified um sure they can still mortal wound you off the table but if they're doing that to you to your zombie dragon they're not doing it to your you know 10 black knights or your 40 grave guard or neferata what about the amulet of screams i like that it a lot to- that to me is like it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't. I get plus one to my casting, dispelling, and unbinding if my vampire is empowered. But if you do get your spell off on a three plus, you take d3 wounds. And for a five wound idiot that's casting spells, maybe I don't cast that spell, maybe I don't risk the, the, the mm-hmm. wounds. In addition to what you mentioned earlier about the spell law, about I can't remember what spell it was, doing one or two mortal wounds to everyone on the board. So you're chipping away and that five wound idiot's dead. Yeah. Uh, You know, it's really funny that you bring this up. I've actually been thinking about this the last few days. Um, It's becoming more and more dangerous to be caster heavy armies nowadays between corn and even OBR's uh, ability of um, uh, like not really caring with null myriad, just a two up to ignore spells, like just massive. And then now there's like abilities like this and one in, uh, Viracost as well. There's just so much consistency of being like, cool, you're a caster. That sucks. Um, I really, really do like that one. Um, the only one that I don't like is the Orb of Enchantment, just because it is swinging. Like, you're going to roll that one or two in a game and you're going to be so disappointed. Um, but I do think the Amulet of Screams is good. And if you have a Warlord Battalion or if you have a Command Entourage and you choose your second artifact, if you choose an artifact instead, you just go for that. Yeah. Bingo. Cloak of Mist and Shadows is my first artifact. Amulet of Screams would be the second. Agreed. Mm -hmm. I could easily see this with um, another unit that I think got a glow up, which is the Coven Throne, because it it got back its spell that kills a hero, can kill a hero, and then gives you a Vampire Lord. 
<laughs> so like that with that with the antler screams would be very fun. That is very cool. Imagine that. Then you kill um you kill a hero, becomes a little vampire. Like yeah, what a, what a great so investment. <laughs> um, so, yeah. and we're we're going to talk a little bit later as well about Legion of Blood because one of the one of the lists um is submitted was a Legion of Blood. Um, yep. Le Legion of Night. So this one. Uh, this one's a little different. It's a little bit different to, to Legion of Blood. What what's your take of take on Legion of Night? And maybe in a similar question, do I have to take Manfred? That's a good question. Um, I I always like running a War Master. I always like having two generals. Um, I feel like every other book in this uh, for the last like six months, I feel like every other book is either CP dependent or not CP dependent. And I get the feeling like Soul Blight is not CP dependent overall, um, since a lot of abilities just got kind of like absorbed into just War Scroll abilities instead, like we talked about with Neferata. So I don't necessarily think you need to bring Manfred, but if I were to bring a, knight, a Legion of Night list, I, I would have Manfred. Um, being able to utilize his uh, extra abilities for the Mortark of Night, in addition to... Um, uh, ageless cunning can be really really helpful i mean he's got a three up save he's got 14 wounds now he got he got two extra wounds um and extra attacks for his sword like he's and an extra rend i think for his um uh, pole arm so being able to do that and um still ignore the first wound taken um i could see him being incredibly strong especially if you don't have a second punchy hero hmm what are your thoughts on the battle traits, right? Because you've got a heroic action. You've got yourself a monstrous rampage. I wasn't a big fan of the monstrous rampage. I'm like, eh, it's all right. I'm like, I mean, P Pestilential Breath and Death Streak are, they're not the greatest. And is it oh. Death Streak? Pestilential breath got worse. Like it's got now so much better. Oh what? no. <laughs> so, so Pestilential Breath used to be one attack, one shot. Um, you either rolled the hit roll which was a three up uh, threes to hit. I think it was twos to wound, um, but degraded. And it was two rent. No, it was three rent. Rent th was, was rent three. There's rent three D six damage. Uh, now it's D six shots and it's 12 inch range instead of eight, like it was before. And it's just threes and threes. So it's consistent, but it's not bad. And it's one rent only, but it's flat three damage. That's really, really good. Cause you could do five shots and then, three go through and then three or two wound. And if it's not something with a good armor save, you could do quite a bit of damage. What's the, what's the rend on it? It's, I think it's only rend one, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me know. Yeah. Cause, uh, cause I think that was the thing that I noticed. I'm like, look, I, I, I always enjoyed the, I think the role has changed, right? It used to be great to kind of chip a hero or a monster. Now it's much more effective on lower armored saved troops true which which goes back to the nature of what how i at least used it before because before you either rolled on a hit roll of a three up or you rolled a dice and if it's under the number of models in the unit then you automatically hit yeah. um, so you could do one or the other and honestly if it was above if it was seven or more models in the unit i just rolled the dice not even look at it and be like oh i hit like you know doesn't matter uh so it's it's always been something that's been consistent against hordes um, as like a potential D3 or D6 mortal wound. To me, I just see more utility in it where I can actually point out the hero or the monster or something and be like, cool, that one thing is going to take D6 shots at three damage. And that can be pretty scary. The the benefit though, and you're right, I, I actually agree with you on that point. I think the benefit here as well is that the pestilential breath on the zombie dragon is red minus one. If you use the jaws of, uh, if you into the jaws of death, um, mm -hmm. it's happening in the, in the charge phase. So they can't use all that defense. So, so, and, and because your snapping more is a range of three inches, it means if you can clear some of the screen, you might be able to use the range to get a juicier target. Oh yeah. No, I agree. I think that that's super helpful. Um, and the fact that it gives you the ability to do one or the other, because it gives you just not only the, the breath, but it gives you the death streak can be useful. So you can really just kind of play to your flavor. Um, I would personally probably play to the zombie dragon flavor, but um, it could also be useful for a vampire Lord on zombie dragon, you know, it's, or, you know what? Nope. 
Uh, I think Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon is just Zombie Dragon keyword, anyways, right? So... Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure this is for both regular Zombie, zombie Dragons and yep. Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon. I'm just pulling up. The they world. are Zombie Dragon keyword as well. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that can be incredibly helpful um, if you do bring that. Um, so. Yeah, you know, I think that that's a really, really, really useful ability, um, especially when you combine it with, you know, things like uh, uh, Swift Form, you know, just, and then of course, Ageless Cunning, which is just always, 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 always going to be useful. I am a big, 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 big fan of out of sequence anything now. Yeah. So yeah, like the moment I saw that, I was like, cool, that's awesome. Like Death Armies can now, especially this and Mortis Praetorians, it's like, Cool. Now we just have uh, Iron Sun's ability suddenly. Like that's cool. What's your thoughts on Swift Form being able to pick two friendly uh, vampire heroes more than three inches and basically do do your little teleport um, around the board? Yeah, uh, for this season you don't need Tunnel Master. Uh, if you have a Vampire Lord on foot, you can just do that. Um, especially since it's not required for a dice roll, you just do it instead. Um, you know, and it says that you can't move, but it doesn't say you can't charge. So that's still pretty fun. Um, I think that you have a lot of uh, ability, and you have there's a lot of synergy there with Legion of Knights, just other uh, core mechanics, and the fact that you know you still aren't taking into account yet the uh, gravesite mechanic or the two unit or um, you know the two units that are conditional battle line like bats and vargais and vargais do get just a natural kind of deep strike a teleport onto the table anyways so there's a lot of like usefulness with legion knight and swift form okay how, how would you use swift form uh primarily i would just use it instead of tunnel master i would just jump on objectives um and the fact that it's a vampire hero but it doesn't uh it doesn't specify uh vampire galatian champion or something like that so you could pick two units one of which could be just a vampire lord on foot and boom now he's getting he's getting your um uh you know he's doing the um why can't i think of the battle tactic right now um the um generic one, the easy did desecrate no not desecrate oh my gosh what is wrong with me right now um doesn't matter it's just the one where galley vet uh holds an objective outside of your territory um oh, I've been playing Sons. I don't care about those battle tactics. Ah, you don't care. Okay. <laughs> I cannot believe why I'm just like, you know, going with right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Someone, someone in the chat will remind us. Like, I was about to in say, like, just cunning. In like 20 minutes, I'm going to be like, cutting, cutting I maneuver. Remember. Cutting, yes, cutting maneuver. Cutting maneuver. Boom. Cutting maneuver. Um, I don't know why I couldn't think of that name. Um, so it's just a free cutting maneuver, basically, without having to worry about uh, Tunnel Master. And then, yeah, if you want to put pressure, you could throw Manfred and teleport him up the board, or you could, um, you know, put a zombie dragon where it needs to be to put pressure, even if it doesn't even charge. You know, you could put it maybe 12 inches away just to make your opponent nervous that you could roll like an 11 or a 12 inch charge and then get into combat. But uh, one of my favorite things about Swift Form is being able to remove yourself um, if you know that you're going to get nuked. <laughs> like, uh, let's say it's your. Um, um, you know, let's say you put yourself in a bad position and you doubled and you know you're not going to be able to get out of something very well. You can then kind of bring yourself back into a way where you're in a safer zone. You know, of course you can't do that when you're in combat, but hopefully you're not at that point already. Yeah, that's no, a, it's a mm -hmm. really good shout. Um, before I ask you about your command traits and artifacts, I just want to point this one out just in case it wasn't explicit. Um, one of the cool things with Angel's Cunnings is the ability to be able to deny your opponent battle tactics. You know, they, they do they do one where, like, I'm going to kill X unit and they, they um, point the finger at a particular unit. You're like, cool, I'm going to now counter charge you in your charge phase and stop yes. that unit from dying. Or if it's the one where, like, your general has to kill something, cool, just tag it with your another unit. The general's not in combat. You've denied their battle tactic. Those mm -hmm. out-of-sequence stuff is so good. Oh, it's incredibly helpful. Yeah. And uh, the cool thing is it's during your opponent's charge phase. So you could like, you could do it right after any sort of start of charge phase abilities. You could do it, you know, after he's charged, they've charged with everything. And you're like, well, I happen to be over here and you've now put, you know, this one unit or this one hero unprotected. And I just happen to have a unit nearby. I'm going to make that charge. And like, you also have to remember that all sonable units with musicians 
have a consistent charge roll of six um, as long as a musician's alive. Like the minimum charge is a six. So there's some consistency there where maybe your opponent, you know, you can tell, especially like since I've been playing a lot of different like kind of armies and lists lately, like you can tell your opponent what musicians do in a, a summonable unit three, four, five, six times, but like they're not going to remember until it happens, you know? What's your favorite command trait? Good question. Um, I don't mind uh, above suspicion. Um, being able to have that, especially if you have Manfred as a war master, I think can be pretty, pretty helpful. Um, you know, I think that everything else, there's the possibility of unending will or unbending will being useful, but I think it's situational. Um, and I just don't like the bait. Um, because yeah. that actually used to be a battle trait for Legion yeah. of Night. And now it's a command ability. I just don't like it. Yeah, so so is above suspicion though. So, uh, that used to be a, a, a battle trait too. Um, was it? Yeah, you used to be able to. Yeah, yeah, you used to be able to just okay. deep strike them. Like that, that that to me, you're you're right though. Like the bait is cool, but just turn one. I'm like, uh, mm -hmm. maybe if it was like turn one and turn two, but turn one. Yes. No, it was turn one and no. turn two. Easy, easy. Yes, for me. Um, but. Yeah, just like, and you got to also remember that most of the units you're going to have are going to have five up saves anyways that are um, night, like summonable units, like f a five up or worse. So yeah, really, it's just not great. Um, it would be above suspicion. That, that's got to be the move. But that or Master of Magic, just, yeah. If we ever go into like a really heavy shooting dominated meta, um maybe because the bait also gives you plus one to your ward rolls too so your deathless would be on on fives um maybe maybe there's a world but yeah i i tend to agree with you in mo in most cases um unbending will or above suspicion yeah no i i agree with you um i don't know if the shooting meta is going to really be a prominent thing just because um not necessarily this book but oh my gosh can can uh petrifex uh obr punish shooting armies so i think that you're going to see some hard counters with with shooting pretty consistently pr pretty consistently like now and the fact that like a huge shooting army is about to be less so uh in our seraphon friends yeah I, I think the question is like what's the next general's handbook what's the incentive and then yeah what's going to come off the back of it, right? Like I keep saying like, you know, fictitiously, I actually don't know. Like imagine the next general's handbook is about magic. So all of a sudden you see a lot more shooting and a lot more castles. So mm -hmm. you, so the bait, the bait would incre increase its value. But at the moment, yeah, I probably wouldn't take the bait. I agree. And so the fact that we are probably looking at this book being one that's going to exist for, you know, anywhere between two to three years, I, I agree with you. It's probably going to be a good expectation to just kind of like sit and see where the new seasons go. You know, I always talk about how, you know, I want that cavalry season. We'll see if that ever happens. You know, at this point, it's going to be like a war cry war band season instead. I don't I know. I want, I want, I want artillery season. Give me artillery yes! season. Yes. Yes. Almost every army has them now, except for this book, I think. What about um, your artifacts? Yeah. Uh, I like, uh, the, um, uh, Corruptian cloak. I definitely butchered that. Um, I think that that's the most useful one. Morbeg's claw is, has been relatively the same for three books. If you count, uh, legions and Nagash, I've never been a fan of it because that requires a hero to stand still. Um, and the shard of night is just, I look at that and I'm just like, dang, I keep on looking at the ethereal save that Legion of Blood got. And now I'm looking at this, like, what are you, what are you, what are you trying to sell me here? So um, it's the cloak for sure. Yeah. When you compare the Shard of Night to the ethereal stuff in the, in uh, Legion of Blood, it doesn't, it doesn't compare. You're like, I'd rather mm -hmm. just that every day of the week. Exactly. All right, that's Legion of Legion of Night. There's some cool things. Obviously, you start to see the difference between Legion of Blood and Legion of Night. Um, anything else? Anything else you want to add on this particular sub faction? No, I think that if you like moving across the board and having board presence, this is the faction. But yeah, I play a lot of Legion of Night. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm looking over the fence, 
seeing that the grass is greener and <laughs> legion, legion of blood was what i would play moving forward i think i think it's just too it, it, it's too attractive like i sure I'll yeah it there. yeah it's very shiny Veercross. Mm. Veercross is Veercross, right? Like you still are focused on your little wolfy heroes. You have a new uh Ivia. Ivia, the new vampire lord on foot. Very um, cool. Well, mm -hmm. She's very and, we'll, and I'll ask your opinion in you know when we get to the war scroll. But what are your thoughts on this one? Oh yeah. So like I said before, um I've always been a big fan of Veercross. I kind of like the aesthetic. Um it's very different. Lore wise, it's very different as well, which if you're if that's your kind of thing, it can be fun. Um and I have always enjoyed the wolves. Um, you know, I would usually run 20 and have 10 to bring on the table from from Chatakar. Um he never skips leg day. He always goes for those narrow squats, he always goes for gigantic quads. Um but uh, I've been a big, big, big fan of just seeing how this is. Now, I will say I have not gotten nearly enough reps with Vircos that I've wanted to get in yet, but I'm very confident that if you don't run Legion of Blood, um, it'll, and it's not even like one is better than the other, I think that more people are going to gravitate towards Legion of Blood because it's got more obvious, straightforward, this is how I'm going to win mechanics. I think that uh Vircos has a little bit more thought that needs to be put into it but i think that it's going to be just as strong over the course of the entire game um there is something that you have on there that's awesome um which a lot of people were very taken aback by with the command traits and the artifacts and how they can be put on a unique character um mm. and i knew people were like oh that's gonna get faq'd or oh that was a misprint i'm like you look at the rest of them and they don't have anything any kind of verbiage like that whatsoever it's very explicit um and to me it's also very explicit that it's done from a sales point because there's one legion of night hero there's one legion of blood hero there's one castle Light dynasty hero there is seven there are seven Virkos heroes right so you they're gonna want you to use the characters that they got you for um and they're all na they're all named up they like all uh, there's there's no unnamed v cross hero like, no all... there aren't there aren't and even more so even even more leaning into that point there are non-hero units that are v cross keyword as well which goes further into the curse city things which other units don't have so, you know, we're looking at Bloodborne, we're looking at the Night Guard, we're looking at um, the Vargas gear, um, the Vargas gear. And so, like, it's it's pretty cool that they have all these kind of little mechanics that can be integrated with them. Um, I'm a big fan. So I'm I'm somebody that doesn't run V-Cross. Um, first, the aesthetic doesn't, like, kind of, like, draw me in. That's fair. Uh, I'm, prob mm -hmm. I'm probably more, like, interview with a vampire, Dracula. Like, uh, if we go back to OG stuff, Alex, like, I would definitely be, like, Von Karstein or uh, Lamia style. That's that's kind of my jam. Yeah. But tell me about this. Like, how does this, this army actually work on the table differently to, like, what I would experience in the past with Night or Blood? Um, I am going to con how am I going to uh, I'm going to say it as simply as I can. Uh, you can run Graveguard in any sub faction you want, and it's going to be good. But if you want to run Graveguard, run them in Virkos. Like if you're going to run more than one unit, rather. So if you want to run twenty, you can just throw that into any of the sub factions. Just I mean, Castellai, I kind of sleep on that sub faction. But um, besides that, twenty, whatever, do it. Uh, if you want to run more than that, if you want to run forty, if you want to be saucy. Yeah, Vircos, for sure. Now and forever, or at least until the next book. Um, it's just the benefits that you get for summonable units and um, the benefits that you get for units near certain characters. Uh, there are so many kind of inner uh, interlapping, um, or overlapping rather, um, kind of buffs and abilities that can uh, help improve your army that don't like counteract each other. Um, is There's a lot of them. And um, I just see a huge amount of utility in this in this book. It's uh, in this sub, sub faction specifically. Um, you know, I mean, hell, look at the fact that you can bring extra bodies on the table. Um, we don't have the war scroll for uh, Belladama up, but she has a spell which is. Um, uh, I love that spell. I love yep. that spell. It's so annoying, but it's so good for sh a shooting meta. 
it's six is a hit cause um, two hits instead of one. And it used to be wholly within 12 of her. Now it's wholly within 24 of her. And it's only casting value six. And she's plus one to cast. You know, so very easily, you know, you just put 70 points in, you get an unholy lodestone corpse cart. And that's going off very, very easily. You can put in your arcane terrain as well if you get lucky on the map. And now it's just laughable unless you fight against something that can unbind super easily. Um, so, you know, who needs a white king on foot when you have a huge chunk of the table that's giving those graveguard the same buff? You know, that's also hard to kill because she still has like a bodyguard mechanic with dire wolves. Um, so on top of the fact that you can add unit, add dire wolves to units and you can add an extra unit of dire wolves onto your ar army. So like every army, when you look at a wounds count, just add 20 to it. Like if you're running beer coast, just, you know, put in parentheses, 20 more, 20 more wounds and you're fine. It's just. And, that, hmm? and that's from the kin of the wolf because uh, Chattaka lost the ability to bring on the 10 wolves. Right. So it's not like you can do that plus Chad that's gone. It's 10 dire wolves. Yeah. So you don't have to add Chad, which also means that his utility and his, like, I would always say that he wasn't like 310 points. Like he was before he was like 180 ish points. Um, and I, if you counted the dogs, you know, very rarely would, I think only once I ever lost him before he had the chance to do the command ability. And that was just a freak accident in the game. Um, he, there's way more utility because now that free unit can come from anyone, um, which your opponent is going to have to realize. And then on top of that, um radicar is uh another big thing with him is he lost the war master rule um which is a bummer uh only belladama which i understand they want just one war master for each sub faction because uh, there were like several war masters in virgos before a lot there was a lot like i was going there through was it i'm like you're a, you're like a sub commander you were a war master you were a, you probably shouldn't have been yeah exactly so unfortunately um He's no longer a war master, but the usefulness of Belladama means that you're going to see her on the table a lot more again. Um, and you're still always going to see Radicar. Like he's far and away super, super, super useful. He is a great hammer. Um, I used to run, I, I won a GT about a year ago where I had a uh, Virkos and I had a zombie dragon. I had Manfred, of course, um, and I had Radicar. And nine times out of 10, the opponents would do, make a beeline for uh, Radicar or Manfred due to Manfred's buff or due to the zombie dragon's um, um, offensive capabilities, and they would just leave Radicar alone. And then he hits them like a brick shit house. Uh, and then it's a problem for them, you know? So, uh, and the fact that he's minus one to hit and minus one to wound now um, is really helpful. The only issue I have with him is that your opponent, if they know his war scroll, um can mess you up because he can never retreat yes like it's on his war scroll so that's something to be aware of uh by the way you're talking about wolf or are you talking about beast the two different oh, versions i don't of even know I, I don't know her i don't i don't know her i the wolf uh no just just the beast <laughs> No, yeah. <laughs> just just in case someone hasn't run Chattica yet, and they're like, and obviously they they open up War Scroll Builder. Oh, wait, there's two there's two War Scrolls. What what's the yeah. dealio? No, I think I think the Wolf. If you want to run him, you can, especially if you're like points limited, because he still has that. If you make a charge, it's a bubble of plus one attack, which went from eighteen down to twelve. But um, oh my gosh, is Radicar the Beast just far and away a better choice? I will say before I ask you your command traits and your artifacts, um, one of the interesting things there with that uh, the infamous uh, lineage is you can bring your zombies above their starting unit size, which is fascinating to me. So, if you run forty or sixty and you you, see, you know you roll one or one to d three, that's like you could be growing a well, that was an unkillable zombie unit, but. I thought that was an interesting rule, although I don't know if I would use a heroic action for potentially one zombie. And that's like, I'm looking at this conservatively. I'm like, uh, probably not. So I agree with you completely, but this further reinforces, at least in my head, this further reinforces the um, sentiment that I had about uh, wolves, like zombie dogs over zombies on uh, uh, human zombies any day for me just aesthetically and gameplay wise um, because it's a dead walker unit that gets affected by that so you know all of a sudden you know you have 
uh, instead of bringing one to three wounds worth of zombies back, you could bring two to six wounds worth of dire wolves back instead. And for me, that's the move. I call that out because you don't naturally associate dead walker keyword to dire wolves because you see dead walker zombies. You're like, okay, cool. Great. I can bring out one mm -hmm. zombie. But then when, as you said, you look at the dire wolf war scroll and it does have the dead walkers keyword. You're like, oh, wait a second. That's now one to three dire wolves, which could be two to six wounds. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's so useful. Um, now, I don't know if that counts for recycling either. Like if you summon a unit of wolves or if you had a unit of wolves on the table and you used uh, pack alpha to bring D3 models to the unit um, and, it, and they can be taken above their maximum unit size, could you then, if they die, recycle them with the extra models added as the recycled unit? Like if they became a 16 man unit instead of a 10 man unit because of two, you know, five ups for the D3 rolls, do you bring eight guys, uh, eight dogs back instead of five? Like, sure. there's a lot of just funky, wonky stuff there as well. My my gut says you use the pitch battle profile, which has the unit size Same. defined. But I see where your question comes from, where it's like, well, if I have grown the unit to be uh, thirteen dogs, then am I bringing back seven at half strength as opposed to, oh, actually, be eight because you round up. It'd be eight because you round up. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. it says like, you add models to the unit, so I think that's something that has to be FAQ'd. And of course, we're talking pre FEQ. So, what's your favorite command trait? Oh yeah, uh, driven by death stench. Um, I again, I like all of them. <laughs> um, I think that you know um, you have to before even looking at the command traits, you have to think about who your hero is or who your general is going to be. And since your general can be a named character, again, <laughs> I'm going to say. Uh, Chattakar is probably going to be my named character, probably going to be my general. So I, when I think about him and I think about these command traits, he could be 12, uh, count as 12 models in an objective. But with Virkos, you're probably running a lot of units and you're probably running a lot of models. So that's cool, but it might not be needed. Um, I think spore tractors could be useful, but for me, I'd rather have Radicar run up the board, be within sexy charge uh, range, drop Graveguard uh, wholly within nine of him from grave sites and give them reroll charges without having to worry about Bloodthirsty uh, Triumph or uh, a command point, you know, or both. So uh, that is really, really useful to me. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, they would, mm -hmm. they would probably, that was probably the order that I would pick because Sport Tracker sounds good and it's going to help you get up the board sooner, but it kind of loses its value over time. Mm -hmm. While re-rolling charges um, is only valuable in certain situations, when you don't land a charge, that's when it sucks. And that can that can punish you in-game. So I would always rather driven by Death Stench, um, especially like if you're smart and you can have, set up like a couple of charges from that nine-inch bubble. Um, exactly. Yeah. And to, to make sure that you don't have issues with that, you can also bring a unit of dogs with you or even a unit of grave, or, I mean, black knights and move up the table with Radicar so that he doesn't uh, get uh, charged instead and he doesn't get stuck and logged into combat, which would be a huge problem for Radicar, uh, not only for his plus one attack buff, but also for, uh, quite frankly, this driven by death sense ability as well. What about your artifact choices? Oh, yeah. So we talked about this earlier when we were talking about Legion of Blood and we were talking about the anti-magic uh, uh, ability. These are all so cool to me. Um, I have been a big fan lately and um, of running uh, extra enhancement being an extra spell or an extra prayer that my armies know instead of an extra artifact. But this is the one exception to it for me recently is just having two artifacts or maybe even three, if you want to be real sassy. Um, the uh, phylactery is something that I think is incredibly useful, especially on Radicar. Um, when you think about him with some dogs backing him up with um uh, with some grave guard that are nearby, even if you fail the charge at the grave guard and they're wholly within nine to get that reroll charge, at least those grave guard are now having a five up ward. So that's something to consider. Uh, five up safe, five up ward. Still, it, it, 20 wounds, that's a lot harder to move 
um, than they would have normally been. Um, I like the Terminus clock, um, but that is something that can be situational, but it's just kind of like an automatic ability. So I would rather have that than the standard of the open watch, uh, I think. And I, and I say that with a big asterisk, I think. My knee-jerk reaction is that the Terminus clock would be really, really helpful just to do to roll the dice and just get it um, on a three-up, make your opponent minus one to cast. Because a big thing, every time I played with Soul Blight, my biggest issues were in Magic Heavy Armies. Total Eclipse, um, uh, previously when Command Points mattered with them, uh, Croak, just like a bunch of more wounds spread, a bunch of buff spells, debuff spells, I had issues with. Uh, or at least I didn't. I, I wasn't. I didn't have issues with, but I had. I didn't like them. <laughs> so I would rather have a three up for an ability rather than the four up for a command point because you're not always going to need as many command points in in this army. Yeah, you had mentioned a few times earlier that you don't think this is an a CP kind of hungry army. Um, and I know. I know a few people were asking me earlier about um, the flattery and saying, you know, would you put it on something like Belladama? Um, you know, obviously Belladama has some good survivability with the bodyguarding rules and things like that, or even like a White King where, I mean, your White King could be brought back to life. Do you get the artifact if you bring, come back for it? Yeah, you would. You would. If you come back to life. That's a good question. I think it has to be FAQ'd because, oh, no, it doesn't have to be FAQ'd. No, no, no. So I checked this earlier. You could double check if you want. Um, yeah. But there's two different paragraphs from character to non-character. And the non-character one, it does say, like it did previously, you get a new unit made up of half the models. Um, and with the character, it just says you bring this model back. So I believe it still has its artifacts, which would make sense because you can't have a new named character in the sense no. of um, uh, Crits of the Rat Prince. You can't have more than one ever, you know? And so why is there a new version of the same exact unique model, right? Like that doesn't fit with how the game works um so i'm pretty sure yeah I'm, I'm quickly having a look at the rules to see what happens with the summer because if it's a obviously if the wording is you replace it with a new a new hero then you wouldn't retain the artifact but if it's bringing the uh, the hero back but um yeah i don't believe it's a, I, I don't believe they have the new like it, it's not a recycled unit it is bringing back the same unit but with uh i think three wounds taken on it so if it's a white king, it's going to have two wounds left. And if it's uh, um, a white king on a skeletal mount, then it's going to have four yeah, wounds if, on it. If you pick a summonable hero on a four plus, you can set up that hero uh, yep. wholly within 12. So, 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 so uh, that sounds to me like you keep your artifact. Yep. Yep. Okay. So really, really useful. And I mean, when you take into account the uh, phylactery and if you have... If you don't choose Tratakar, if he's just a guy in your army, because I think he should always be in your army if you're running Viracos, but if he's not your general and you have, say, a White King on foot or a White King um, uh, a white king that's uh, on Skeletal Steed and they have the Phylactery, then they themselves are also benefit benefiting from the 5-up ward. They themselves are summonable, so it makes them a lot harder to kill. You're looking at 7 wounds on the, on the Skeletal Steed, three up save five up uh word save just innately very helpful yeah that's hot all right you you, you kind of convincing me a little bit on, on <laughs> the cross. I, i'm not i'm not a hundred percent sold but I'm, I'm yeah i'm leaning in i'm leaning a bit more in there you go okay what i'm not sold on is castellai and look there is mm. some play here but i think there's there's more to this faction that's it's not the castellai rules for me it's that I'm not a big fan of Blood Knights, and I was hoping Blood Knights would get an improvement like Chaos Knights, because realistically, like you lost the um, the fist of, the fist of Nagash, which was on Prince Vordry, got changed because um, that was a hero face fight, which was really cool. Like I, I personally am not a drawn to a Castellai army. Where do you stand? And if we did make it, how would you build a Castellai list? Uh, I have not leaned on Blood Knights since 1.0. Um, I've kind of just I enjoyed them when they were when there was a Soul Blight sub allegiance in the 1.0 rulebook when there was no Death Army. I really, and we really could regenerate, it. and we could regenerate vampire yeah. Blood Knights with the banners. 
Absolutely loved that. Loved that. My, but... mate, my, 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 one of my best mates, Deke, would uh, run like four or five units of Blood Knights, and he would just recycle. So he'd he'd hit me with the with the Blood Knights, then retreat them and recycle, and then hit me with another no. unit. And it was just this constant back forth of regeneration, hit regeneration, and annoy the crap out of me. Shout out, Deke. Oh, thanks for your support, but <laughs> man, that was tough. It was tough. Yeah, so good, so good. Um... However, with uh, Castle Dynasty in the previous book and this book, uh, I, I got to say, I'm fully in agreement with you. I, I do sleep on it. Um, I first, uh, on initial read through, I realized I was like, oh, this is almost identical to the previous version of Castle Dynasty. I don't like that at all. And then I looked at it a little further and I was like, yeah, yeah, this is almost identical to the previous rules, just a little bit less useful. I mean, um, uh, I don't know. They they still have the might from the Crimson Keep. Um, that the, hasn't the battle, changed. The hmm. battle craze rule that monstrous rampage for a Castellai monster is quite cool. Being able to give it plus one to wound, so you you sure. very much like that. That's interesting. Um, the heroic action is interesting. Um, I, I think it's more about the unit selections. Like it's encouraging you to run Blood Knights. Um, yeah, that just that, that's that, that's the thing for me competitively. But if I was running like a narrative, I love the kits. Then yeah, run run Castellai to your heart's content. Yeah, no, I agree. And every time I fought against a Castellai army, it's like that person really wants to play Castellai. So you know what? Good on them. Um, I think Master Retaliation can be really fun on Four Dry or on a Zombie Dragon, um, but. Yeah, like the fact that the shifting keep, just like we talked about with Legion of Night, where some command traits were previously battle traits, like the shifting keep going into a command trait instead, it's just weird. It's weird. It's clunky to me. It's clumsy. I'm not a fan. I think if I was running a Castellai, I'm probably running two Vampire Lords on Zombie Dragons or Prince Four Dry and a Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon. Then I'm running, you know, some, some bats, some blood knights and maybe some skellies um Vord Vordry can never get a break um Vordry is consistently more expensive and worse than a vampire lord and zombie dragon every single time and i don't know what to say it's just not good i'm not yeah, a fan. look look and if people if you're listening to this and you are a castellai dynasty vampire you love them let me know in the comments like try to convince me it's uh, it's not that i don't like them i just don't see the value like i just think about the same archetype put it into a different sub faction and i just think the army's better totally agree absolutely agree if you were going to pick a castellai army what would your command trait and the artifact that stands out for you um you know i just like the uh, Virkos, I like the reroll charges, so I'd probably go with Swift and Deadly as Same. my primary command trait. Um, and with the artifact, um, you know, there's something to be said about uh, combining that with the red casket. So not only are you rerolling charges, but the general, who's probably a zombie dragon, is going to be rerolling charges at plus three. Uh, that to me just seems like the best kind of combo. I would, yeah, that was the first one that stood out for me. Fragment of the Keep would probably be my second artifact, mm -hmm. but Red Casket definitely stood out for me because I don't want to fail that charge. Yeah, yeah, especially in a Zombie Dragon because you should probably be bringing in with the Death Lance and you're probably going to want to make that charge. <laughs> yeah, thousand yeah, percent. Uh, Avangori, Avangori, our monstery type one, and I know you're you're a bit more of a fan of this than I am. Although I have become a fan, I, I wasn't a fan in the old book of Avangori. Now with the changes to Lukavai and the Vangorian Lord, and now that they're not as crazy wild in the hero phase, I'm coming around to this sub faction. Yeah, I'm a really, really big uh, fan of the changes of Angorian Lords. I still don't think Avangori is not my favorite sub faction by far, but it is not my least favorite. It is my second least favorite sub faction in the army, um, but it's not one that I like would hate running. Like if I went to a tournament and I played five rounds with Castellai, I'd be irritated by halfway through the first round. If I played Avangori and I built a list and I knew what I was doing and I had a few drinks in me, 
I'd have fun pretty much the whole tournament. I could see myself having fun. Um, the uh, the Vangorian Lord, something that we we didn't broach last time, is its combat profile got massively better. I mean, it used to have four attacks at D3 damage. Now it's four attacks at two damage, one rend. Um, and its claws, its uh, talons, or its, its tail is now one rend as well, but it's identical to what it was before. But most importantly to me is its Gorgon's talons uh, are still three attacks. They're three inch range now. They might have been three inch range before, but they are. Uh, they were previously forced to hit threes to wound, one rend, d6 damage. Now they're twos to hit, or I'm sorry, threes to hit, twos to wound, uh, two rend, three damage, which is huge. Like those fours to hit were such a bummer. And now it's like, yeah, you know, you might not need to bring a zombie uh, vampire lord on zombie dragon when you know you can have consistent damage three uh, at three inch range uh, <laughs> that can hit a lot better. So, um, and at least wound a lot better too. So, yeah, I think that like a uh, Vangorian lord and Luca Vi and a ton of monsters and small bits is, is the move here. Same question as I've asked you in every other sub faction do I have to take Luca Vi? Yes. Yes, her uh, spell is incredibly helpful. Um, I, as I mentioned yet again, I've been playing a lot of corn, and in the previous book, having the six-inch pile and six-inch activate was such a strong mechanic, um, especially if your opponent couldn't redeploy, which I know death won't have an option to do. But um, having, you know, the ability to just kind of like run units up the board, not care about shooting, and then just be like, "Cool, I'm going to pile into you." is just such a strong mechanic. You make that uh, Vangorian Lord move uh, an auto run six. So now they're moving uh, you know, 18 inches and then they're gonna have that 24 inch threat zone at any one time and not have to worry about Unleash Hal is just really, really strong. If you were gonna run an Avangori list, how mm -hmm. many monsters do you think is the sweet spot? Ooh, I'll bring one monster for one Vingorian Lord or Lucavi. So if you had like Lucavi and Avengi, I would probably want to run two or one of each, like, or I mean, I'm sorry, one monster per Vingorian Lord. So I'd probably run two zombie dragons in addition to, uh, just because of that free ability to just kind of hand out the hunger on a zombie dragon can be so helpful to keep them alive. Would you run a Terrorgeist uh, solo? Um, yeah, I could see a terror geist being useful. My, my issue that I have with the terror geist is that, um, it doesn't have the same type of utility that a uh, zombie dragon has. I don't think it can deep strike, right? It, no, just no, the zombie no. dragon does. Yeah. So that makes it like, you look at a zombie dragon, 14 inch move four up save, you know, it's cool, but it can get removed off the table with relative ease when you start making sure that it can just show up within nine and now it's got only one turn it has to deal with like getting shot at or something like that uh depending on the mission it can be a huge boon the reason i ask is because while you say that um as you said the vangorian lord's got a great spell so he could use the hunger on the terror guys to keep it healed up um you could combine it nicely with this unstoppable nightmare potentially and even the cursed abomination at the top, being able to fight with that terror geist on its top profile, um, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not a completely against it. Um, but oh, yeah. I, I do see your argument. And I, I'm pretty sure they're all the same point cost now. Like they used to be different points, and now both of them are just a flat 300. So you yeah, don't have to are. worry. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll quickly check, but I, I think you're right. I think they are both 300. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Terror Guys 300, Zombie Dragon 300. And they're both battle line in Avangori too. Yes, yes. So you could bring maybe two of them and then 20 skeletons to hit uh, your back line. Um, and I'm pretty sure, and uh, Vargais are battle line, conditional battle line in Avangori as well now. They used to only be conditional battle line in um, Legion, in Legion of Night. Knight. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Vargeist up in both uh, both Avangori and Legion of Night battle line, mm -hmm. which also deep strike. So that could be fun. Um, the only thing I would recommend is if you run Var Vargeist, especially in Avangori as well. Um, I never like MSU Vargeist. I would run like a unit of them, like a, a significant one. Like I would run six or nine. 
Um, do I think it's the best move? No, I just wouldn't do it. But like, if you wanted to, I would run a bigger unit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. It's always their range is, is the thing that gr kind of grinds me down. Like, yeah, I could see a three to six, like going to nine, you're, you're basing it off attrition. Um, Cause you'll never get those nine attacks in like those. They'll no. never get elected combat. No, no, not at all. I see that. Favorite. Yeah. Favorite are uh, commentate and artifact. Yeah. Um, I like the monster smite, especially if we do the idea that you mentioned with the terror guys and having your general be on the board with like a monster moving up the board with them. Um, that aura can be really, really useful. Um, the artifacts, you know, they, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, like they all have their uses, but, um, I'd probably go with, uh, they're all once per battle. It honestly, yeah, that, issue yeah that, that, that grind me insane. I think it's the collar for me. If I'm going for an artifact, it's the be able to, the bearer strikes first. So you got to make the yeah. most of that, that one combat. Yeah, yeah, that would probably be the move that I would do as well. Um, I could see the Breath of the Void mod being helpful as well. Um, but that is also, again, just once per battle. So it is very swingy. Um, I, I just wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, I would probably just do Gorsuch's Color. Or frankly, uh, I would probably do like a generic artifact as well. Like... Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, with the Vingorian Lord, actually, a generic artifact wouldn't be very helpful. Never mind. I, I will say though, the command traits. I do like Unhinge uh, Rampager because you get to mm -hmm. reroll charges. So the same thing we talked about with Veercross. Um, if someone happens to shoot, let's say your Vingorian Lord, um, and you allocate the wound, they're going to get a free uh, six up to D six um, inch move as long as they're outside of nine. So you're creeping them up the board um, or yep. repositioning. So. Not, I don't know. Uh, even just being able to reroll charges again is, is a pretty handy ability. Mm -hmm. Which is a very consistent theme. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else about Anvin Gori? I swear, are we, at the, are we at the last one? Ah, yes, yeah. match play rules. Yes. <laughs> this book goes forever. We haven't even gone. It does. Imagine, like, imagine we went through like every single War Scroll. We'd be here oh, forever. Yeah, we'd be here for a weekend. Uh, <laughs> um. <laughs> But yeah, grand strategies. I think I think this, I think this is going to be an easy one because I looked at your lists and I think all three of your lists had all the same grand strategies. So where are you at, and why do you like what you like? And I'll say the runner-up for my uh, favorite is Empire Corpses. However, um, especially if you run Veracruz, it's a lot of summonable units. But like, I've played a game with like where my Scar Bloodwrath and my Corn Army died top of one. And then I rolled 10 times and did not get an eight up at the end of each movement phase. So like once in a while, you'll play that game where you're just not rolling a three or a four up to recycle a unit and you're not going to get your grand strat, which is going to be painful, um, especially three times that you have to do it. Uh, Luster Domination, far and away, is my favorite grand strategy in this book. Um, Crimson Larder is just terrible. It's the exact opposite side of it. I don't know why they keep putting in the uh, complete four. Uh, oh, sorry, that's not, 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 not that one. This is a, was it a complete the, the grand strategy, no heroes? Uh, no, ugh, ugh, no. Talk yeah. to me about <laughs> why. why what, ugh, ugh. I just assume yeah. the last one is always the one that's like, score four battle tactics from your, from yeah. your list. And like. Well, the OBR one has that too. So They all do. They all do. You're, this is like one of the first books that doesn't have it. Yes. Yeah why mm. why lust for domination what what really stands out for you and um talk to me about this so you obviously got to uh, control more grave sites than your opponent uh and grave site controlling is the same as objective controlling yes um which is really really important to remember uh so when i had mentioned earlier when we talked about grave site placement especially for like a new player that might not have a complete grip of the table to have that if they have that template of that six inch circle or that 12 inch diameter circle to just kind of move around the board to see where your object or grave sites can be you need to think about those as kind of new objectives for the end of the game for you so um I would never, I mean, you, can, you can't you can place a gravesite 
within an inch of the center of an objective or within an inch of a terrain piece. So because of that too, you want to be able to, just like we talked about before, of not putting your grave sites near a board edge so you can have a maximum circle of radius for, to bring models back in um, or to bring them from reserve with. Um, you also want to make sure that you are not giving your opponent the ability to easily score an objective and prevent you from getting less from domination. So I'm a big fan of barely or if not at all overlapping the uh, six inch circle from the uh, a grave site to the six inch circle from an objective. Yeah. Yeah. So and if your I opponent wants to. Mm -hmm. Don't keep going. I was going to say, so if your opponent wants to deny your grand strategy, they're walking off the objective. That's all I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, no, spot on. I think that what I was going to basically continue and say, what you don't want to do, and I see a lot of uh, newer style players use their grave sites right near the objective, and that mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. That's where the battle's going to take place. That's why you do it. But then you limit yourself to the regeneration and the summoning. You you, you restrict yourself on the grand strategy. So it's – it's but I, if I was you folks – sit down on a table the next time you sit down with your i don't know at a, at a local game store or at home measure it out measure it out and see you've got the objective here the the aura is this large like how far do you want to be from an objective and from terrain to score your grand strategy but also to be able to maximize your regeneration and like you're bringing back from the dead or even being able to come in from uh, from reserve with it yeah, uh, I agree. So definitely Lust for Domination is like by far my my favorite grand strat. How do you, without going into the detail of all the battle tactics, how do you feel, are they achievable? Are they, some of them are okay? Um, and are they ones that you sit, you kind of feel like you score more than others? Yeah, um, well, the good thing is uh, just like the last few books, um, Games Workshop has been pretty consistent where at least three of your battle tactics and one of your grand strategies are ones that were from previous White Dwarf updates. Um, you know, this one, it's word for word exactly the same. Uh, so half of your battle tactics, if you're a soul black player, you've already been playing with. Um, they just may have made it a little bit more kind of explicit with maybe one of them, like... Um, uh, uh, oh, they changed the name of it. There used to be one called Lust for Blood, which was weird because of Lust for Domination um, Grand Strategy. It's, um, I'm not changing my, I'm not I'm not making a new card for it. It's still going to say Lust for Blood for mine. But um, it is the um, the healing from the hunger one. Uh, it, so it's uh, Cursed on Life. Yeah, um, Cursed on Life. Super duper useful because, and I was actually shocked that they didn't change the verbiage from the previous book because it's just like that. It was just pick two friendly vampire units or your general. Your general could be the war master. You know, it could the war master. Uh, you know, is is someone who's a general in your army. So you know, it makes a lot of utility where you know your general or your war master or two other vampire units can heal from the hunger, and boom, they get it. So um i really like that uh a lot of them can be really really helpful i enjoy um some of them are just crazy easy expand the grave vampires it's just great it's just i thought the, the game i thought the choices vintage was another easy one pick an mm -hmm. enemy hero on the battlefield is if you kill it with the vampire hero you get your battle tactic like that's it's a no-brainer exactly exactly there was one grand uh, battle tactic that did go away and it was uh recycle a unit uh, which was, of course, on a five-up previously. Real glad that that's gone. Um, but uh, another one that I've always really enjoyed, too, is uh, Callus Overlord. Um, if you have a very, very hurt unit and you know that they're going to be able to get into combat, you can just very easily sacrifice them. Let's say it's a few zombies. Or um, I had played in a tournament where I had a dire wolf yet left. And I was playing against a big wall list with Kragnos and a bunch of gut rippers and uh, you know, the, the bolt boys and shit like that, uh, stuff like that. Um, and uh, I was like, cool, Callus Overlord, Dire Wolf, he's out of combat. And I move him towards Kragnos and the guy redeploys Kragnos. He goes, absolutely not. I am not letting you get into combat with Kragnos. And I make the charge and he's like looking through the core rules and he's like, can I choose not to fight? I'm like, mm -mm -mm, like, <laughs> 
It's very good. Very satisfying. My, my gut read and what I'm hearing from you is that the battle tactics are good. There's a lot of yes. ones that are, are achievable. You can see there is a common theme either focused on uh, like vampire or summonable. So uh, yes. obviously if I'm Castellai, then I lose a lot of those summonable type ones because you don't run a lot of Castellai. But on average for the average player, you should have a bunch of uh, easily to score battle tactics. That's right. Some good ones here. Like some They're really very good. Ones. Comparing yeah. them to OBR, I was very bummed out to see that there was like situational ones, you know. It's not Zinch slash Daughters of Cain good, but it's bloody good. It's good, yeah. It's very good stuff. Very high level, because I want to get to your lists, um, and we will be here forever. I've said this like a hundred times okay. already. A couple of questions with Nagash. Do you like Nagash? Is he worth his points? If you were going to run him, how would you run him? And what would you need to see if we didn't? So let's start off. Let's start off at the top. Nagash, War Scroll update. I'm going to say Nagash's War Scroll got a glow up. It improved. It got some good stuff in the profile. He's got a ward save. There's a whole bunch of great things that happened to Nagash. Without looking at the points, Alex, do you like Nagash? Yeah, he's good. He's 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 okay. Um, I mean, yeah. If you don't look at points, he is ignore points. Great. Ignore points. He's right. great. Um, a lot of the weaknesses that he had before are gone. He used to have a four up ward only against mortal wounds. Now he gives a bubble of five up ward all across, including himself. Um, he still, unfortunately, has a damage table with how many spells he can cast, but his plus three to cast is never degraded, which is really really good now. Um, but you know, he lost an attack with one of his weapons. It's fours for the sword and or four attacks for the four, sword and four attacks for the staff. I think the sword might have been five attacks before and then four attacks for the staff. Um, but another really important thing is he used to be forced to hit with a couple of his weapons and uh, melee weapons, and now it is threes to hit and threes to win with both. So he got better in combat. Uh, he got more consistent with his plus three to cast always existing. And um, yeah, I I like him. I I think he's useful. And he knows all the, all the spells from the army he's in. He does does great jobs recycling units with the Supreme Law of Undead. There's like there's, mm -hmm. there's some really good stuff. Okay. Now this is where if people haven't looked at their book, they see he is 965 points currently. So he was 900. He's now 965. He also gained two wounds. That's worth calling out. Sure. Points value. Now, where do you stand with Nagash? Uh, I think he has utility, just not in a soul blight list. Um, for I 965. That, for 965. Yes. For 965, I would not run him in a soul blight list. Um, there are other art units you can have that will have more utility that will survive to uh, for you to get the most return on your investment um, in, in other areas in this book. Um, when I try to build a list, I do try to think of that return on investment for points. And, um, you know, of course there's a total that can become something where you can just only think that way and it can actually be detrimental to your play. But, um, just from 35,000 feet up looking down, um, I'm not a fan of him in explicitly a soul bot list. Folks, I just want to call out this particular point. We are talking at a competitive level. If you love Nagash, you painted it up, it's your favorite model, run it, you do you. It's nothing wrong with running Nagash. That's not what we're saying. But if I was going to a grand tournament next month and I had Nagash as an option, what I'm hearing, and I agree with you, is that Nagash is something that I would not bring to my tournament list if I wanted to do the best that I could. Mm -hmm. I think that he is best in a uh, night hunt army. I think he is useful in an OBR army, but very, very hard to run an OBR army. I think that he is not something to be considered in legions for now. Uh, in fact, he might have to, uh, you know, play, but we're all just waiting for that new book for them. How many points would you pay for this war scroll? So if there was a points adjustment in the next general's handbook, what would change your opinion? that this now becomes a viable option competitively. I think he needs to be around Archeon points. Um, if not, maybe slightly more expensive than Archeon, not like a hundred plus points more expensive than Archeon. I mean, you will talk to, I mean, 
playing talking to people who don't play uh death armies and talking to people who play chaos armies for example they always say archeon's too many points so of course if you could talk in death circles you can say nagash is too many points but nagash is also one of the most important uh, expensive units in the game and uh though he now has a ward save which is helpful you know if he if he had the ability to ignore instant death in some way i would say he's worth his points but he doesn't so there are those little tricky things in the game that can kill him automatically and um doesn't make him worth it to me not not at 965. i, I think the challenge folks is not just the points valued but it's the flow on effects that if you pay 965 currently it's then you've only got like a thousand points to play with for your battle line, your three battle line options and everything else that needs to happen. So that's part of the problem, again, at a competitive level. But Alex, I know you're a creative, strategic genius. If you were going to run Nagash, what would it look like? Like, like, would you build around cheap, summonable bodies? Would you just drop all your, you know, your Neferatas, your Manfreds, your Vampire Lords and put those big, put those hero points into Nagash, like what would your list look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think that Nagash would be best, like he doesn't have all of the benefits that make him useful in a lot of the sub factions. A lot of the sub factions are based around vampires. Um, all, all of them are uh, in terms of keywords. The only one that's not uh, the only ones that are not are Avangori and Virkos primarily. So you would want to lean into those directions to try to go for benefits for the, uh, for the units. Right. So um, honestly, I would probably go with uh, the sub faction at some point doesn't even matter. It really uh, um So you would probably want to knee jerk reaction Virkos him and a vampire lord um, so that you can do the, you know, vampire lord on foot attacks, then immediately another unit gets to attack. Uh, and then as many like skeletons as possible, just to be like, cool, here are the bodies, knowing that you're going to be able to bring 10 wolves on the table and just leave it at that. And skeletons coming back at the start of the combat phase. So I, I think it's just that constant grind uh if you do get the unit gone then you've got the supreme lord of the undead to bring him back but yeah i think that would probably be how i would do it as well yes um which i need to double check and i need to see what units have the mordant keyword if they if there are any uh, flesh eater courts flesh eater courts that is flesh eater courts okay yeah okay. the the, uh, the mordant is uh flesh eater courts mm, okay okay yeah, they don't i see okay yeah i don't know it's hard it's hard to build them if you want to play the big hat man absolutely play him <laughs> yeah cool all right then i think yeah look and if his points change no problems but i think right now it's just a bit too hard um to, to justify the big man um but the little the little person is ivia um new unit 135 points it's kind of cool you're you're a veer cross person. Do you would you include this in a veer cross, and would you include it out of a veer cross? Um, I would not include it out of a veer cross. Generally, I would definitely keep it in veer cross, but it's not a requirement. It does not. She does not give any additional benefits in on her war scroll that affect friendly units. Um, she's just a foot character that can have another unit swing with her in the uh, in the combat phase if you're in a veer cross army. So I like her that way. She's not a caster, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, my biggest thing that uh, I'm a huge fan of is the, uh, you know, behemoth bane rule. Just far and away, boom, saw that and said, cool, 135 points, sweet, bringing it in my list. Like uh, the ability for her to make uh, Maw Crusher. Maw Crusher is a perfect example. All of the attacks are one like and and you and you you can do that and let's say you have a very eager opponent and they're like cool i'm gonna use the destroyer like i'm popping the destroyer right now it's like cool <laughs> do pop the destroyer like worst case scenario you know uh you focus one or more attacks onto her to try to kill her to avoid this buff and now you've just put you know 300 points plus into 135 points and i still have other things in combat 
So I think that uh, you can play the game in a way where she becomes something where you put her in a position where she's in the areas that your opponent wants to be uh, with their monster, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, ignore the behemoth for a second because, you know, like, like think about it, like being able to pin down Marathi, like such a great trade piece to kind of pin down Marathi and, mm. and stop her mm. from like wreck it, wrecking yeah. face to the rest of your army. Think about all of the Archeons, the, the killy, killy monsters that want to go at you, a Mega Gargan, but it's more than that. A lot of armies have Catacross, Catacross a monster? No. Not, not a monster. Really. Not a monster. But like this... Just th this thing that all the different, like, you know, monster options out there um, for mm -hmm. 135 points. Not bad. Yeah. Uh, giants, again, perfect example of something that you throw in there. Um, the only dragons. monster I think, dragons, perfect example. Oh, yeah. A unit of dragons. If she's in combat with a unit of like two or four dragons, one tag each, baby. Yeah. Not doing anything. Exactly. Um, the, moment the only behemoth she doesn't want to be in combat with is scarbrand because scarbrand is going to be like oh cool carnage i only roll one dice anyways yeah okay like yeah yeah, yeah that that is a that is a bad time don't go hunting scarbrand outside of scarbrand yes. yeah I, th I think you're right I, I can't think of any other monsters that i would avoid yeah no no i mean like she you run her up on a again a son to behemoth or uh frost lord uh you know what the frost lord the stonehorn has enough attacks different sequence of attacks where it can still be pretty deadly it's got the horns it's got the stomp it's got the spear it's got the uh it's got the kick still you know like you want to make sure that it doesn't die to, that she doesn't die to the impact hits but she still wants to be within three no you're right if you're gonna if you're gonna stonehorn you're gonna charge you're gonna charge her into the stonehorn you don't want to be charged because six wounds four up save is not going to go very far no 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 but you're per you're perfectly correct on like those matchups with uh god level characters and um and some of the more alpha strong generic things like again first thing that i can think of is just the multi-attacked um mock crusher yeah yeah kragnos you mean you mentioned kragnos yeah i think to me like where, where it hurts as a gargan player is the gargan player's got le less attacks but they have high volume attacks. So if you get me down to one and I miss with those attacks, because they are quite um, gambly at times, um, my Gargan's going to sit there for, for weeks just trying to get out of this stupid combat. Yeah, a quarter of your army is now doing a lot less. So you've given me you've given me a couple of lists. We might, we might only have time for two unless you, you, you want to go for the third. Um, I'm, I'm always conscious of time. Like These, these things go for oh, Of course. Um, and especially this book, this book is so deep. It's so big. And, and we're only scratching the surface here. <laughs> we're only scratching the surface. Um, here's your first list. It's a Veer Cross list, Lust for Domination. You've got Radica the Beast as a general, uh, Command Trait as Hunter Snare, and the, fuck, this stupid name, Ulfankari Philanthropy, um, the Belladama with the Spirit Gale, Necromancer, uh, Ivia Volga, um, the Vampire Lord with Spirit Gale and Tunnel Master. What spell would be on your Necromancer, by the way? Um, Necromancer and uh, Necromancer would have uh, Waste Away, and then Tortugalus would have uh, Fading Vigor. Sweet. You got Torgus oh yeah, as well. Uh, you got d two units of Dire Wolves, a unit of Skellies, two units of Grave Guard, and a Corpse Guard, wrapping up at 2k on the nose with uh, Battle Reg and Warlord. So. We've talked like for two hours now, all the theory. How's it all come together here? What's the combinations? What is this trying to do? Yeah. So the good thing is that you have boots on the, primarily, you know, you're going to have some things in the grave, some things not. Um, so you are going to have a lot of boots on the ground and you are going to be able to be there. Um, I'm always a big fan of having body blockers, especially in armies like this. So you're not going to have as much punch as say uh, certain other armies, like maybe another list that we have here uh, today, but you have um, consistent casting. You know, you have uh, three, uh, three spell casters. Um, one, Belladama has two casts, uh, Necromancer and Vampire. Oh no, I'm sorry. You have three casters. So you have uh, five, spells that can be cast between Belladama, Vampire Lord, Necromancer, and Torticolis, uh, or Torgilius, or whatever. Um, 
And then they should all be near the corpse cart. So they're all plus one to cast. Makes Belladama plus two to cast. Um, she should always be casting her War Scroll spell that gives the sixes to hit, cause an extra hit. That makes those 20 Grave Guard, if they're outnumbered, surprisingly good in combat. That makes the Grave Guard units incredibly good in combat. Um, and so you don't have to worry as much about their fours to hit. Um, you combine that, you have the ability, especially with a um, Telemaster Vampire Lord with proper charges in place with Radicar. There's a lot of like synergy that are in, that's involved here. Um, you can run Radicar up the board, have maybe a cycled uh, cycled units of Graveguard coming out of the grave in one or two turns. Um, I don't. I wouldn't probably bring both of them out at the same time, but uh, you could if you wanted to. But let's say the Graveguard charge in the combat phase with the reroll charges. And then he makes his charge as well because he's probably closer to the opponent. Um, then he automatically gives plus one attack to those grave guard. But you've also tunnel mastered with your uh, vampire lord in the appropriate spot, knowing where your grave sites were already, knowing where you were going to put those grave guard, um, and making sure that the move that Radikar had was the move that he had. So maybe forcing the the run run move. So all of a sudden. Your grave guard, whether it's one or two units, uh, will be plus one to hit in an aura because Radicar made a charge. And then you use a command point, and now the grave guard are an additional attack because of the vampire lord. So, you know, Radicar hits very, very, very hard, hits like a truck. And now you're having 20 grave guard that are hitting with four attacks each, exploding sixes to hit. Yeah, I mean, the, the grave guard combination is just so good, especially when you have the vampire lord with the plus one attack. With the with Torgilius, because again, I don't see a lot of lists with Torgilius and you know some of the others like Gorslap, but I think they're going to start becoming more and more popular. Uh, sure. In a in a Veer Cross list, they the summonable units get a ward of five plus holy within twelve. Are you protecting the Grave Guard before they get into combat, or is this more for like defensive objectives like your Dire Wolves or um, even your Skellies? That's a great question. Um, I think that it is. Um, it really depends on the opponent, and it depends on the mission, and it depends on the and the opponent's army as well. So, um, like, if your opponent is playing very kind of pitched battley, and they don't have any kind of tricks up their sleeve, or you know that they're not playing an army that has kind of like some trick shot stuff involved, um, then you could, if you're not worried about it. Have him, you know, if there's maybe one or two objectives in your territory or just one, just have him surrounded by 20 zombies on the objective. And now they, you know, he's giving that five up ward save to them. He's hard to kill um, as well. So it becomes just a very useful kind of anchor in your army, holding objectives, uh, denying teleports or whatever, you know, just being there on the table. Um if you want him to be offensive and walk up the board with some grave guard or walk up the board with some skeleton, I mean, uh, uh, some skeletons that could be useful 12 inch range with a, four, a 40 mil base. You could have the skeletons going behind him, uh, holding up the rear and you could have grave guard in front of him, uh, all benefiting from the five up ward. In addition to the five up ward bubble that Radicar the beast is also going to be giving to his units. Um, so there's just so much utility and his, he's got a ranged weapon that's damaged too. So that could be fun. <laughs> One of the few shooting units. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nagash lost his shooting attack, but, uh, Torgilius yes. has gained attack. Amazing. Amazing. Um, Anything else you'd want to talk about with this particular list? I love it. It's different, um, especially for a Veer Cross list where there'd be certain things you'd expect to beat. I mean, look, Radic is there. Um, you've got, uh, I mean, I love seeing Ivia in the list. Uh, Torgilis is a great addition. The double Grave Guard is fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask a dumb question. Why didn't you? Oh, these are these are reinforced Grave Guards. That's what I was going to ask you. Um, yeah. I was going to ask you a question, but no, ignore that. Um You've obviously gone two units of Grave Guard, which are just going to slap when they're in combat. Uh, Dive Wolves can be a great screen. You've got a whole bunch of nice little benefits in Veer Cross. Um, and the Corpse Cut giving you the pluses to cast as opposed to the debuff. So I dig it. And remember, there's 10 more wounds that aren't on this list. There's 10 more Wolves that will be on the table with this army. So that's just a lot of bodies too. 20 wounds, yeah. Ten, two, two wounds each, so be... Mm -hmm. Um, while, while we're talking die wolves before we move on, um, 
we haven't acknowledged the six inch pile in. Do you no. what are your thoughts on the changes to the die wolves and does that change alone make you think about building a list around die wolves? Yeah, um, you could run like a meme list and just have so many uh, zombie dogs on the table. Um, it, it will be difficult to fit a lot of them on. Like if I put this entire list on the table alone, there are some deployments where you are filling up almost every nook and cranny you can. So like you generally wouldn't want to run too many wolves. But I think, to me personally, the good maximum is the two units that you purchase because they're only like six and a half points a, mo a wound. They're they're thirteen points a model, and so they're just uh, uh, so 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 helpful when it comes to um, you know the utility that you can have. You can uh, counteract your opponent with a six inch pile in. You can tie things up. Um, I at uh, LVO uh, I played in the doubles tournament. And I had a unit of 10 direwolves tie up Sigvald in combat. Like, you know, isn't that great? It's like, oh, no, I don't get my ward safe. I don't get my armor safe either. Oh, well, like, anyways, you know, you killed two dogs, you know, continue. Good. Go you. Go you. Yeah, go you. Before I move on, before I move on, what is the benefit to you for the six inch pile in? Like, it's because obviously like zombies had the six inch pile in and they did mortal wounds on their attacks. And like, there was some jank, broken jank, right? But some of that's gone. Um, but for the person who maybe not, is not quite connecting the benefit of a six inch pile in on a dire wolf, where do you see the value or why, why is that a valuable asset to you? Yeah, so you know, there's the term "always be charging," and you don't have to do that whatsoever with direwolves. You don't want to do that with direwolves. Um, so because they have a natural six-inch pile, and you and, and I wish I had like a map up here, and I could, you know, um, um, you know, John Madden it with like little itineraries and little movements here. Yeah, but um, if you have the ability to uh, pile in and activate within six, it is such a such a helpful tool in many different instances uh, versus your opponent. You can, um, in their charge phase or in their combat phase, you can now like get into combat and let's say they were expecting to be free and clear and wipe a unit out. Now they're stuck with another unit in combat that they weren't expecting before. If they weren't aware of this six inch pile in, um, uh, I would love, I love them as the idea of a screen. So, you know, especially with Radicar being and, and Graveguard being some of the punches in your, in this list, they can move up the table. Um, and because you lost the ability to be plus one to hit and plus one to wound on the charge with direwolves, but you got a six inch pile in, there's no incentive for you to be making charges. So you should be running up the board at all times. So they're not moving 10 inches, they're moving 11 to 16 inches with an additional six inch activation. And if they need to tie something in so that maybe in the next turn or in that same turn, Radicar can just go in and do what he needs to do, maybe backed up by some grave guard, maybe not, then that's gonna be something that's really helpful. In addition to that, um, if somebody is putting their army in like on, on a line and you have a, a one wolf or in your unit within six inches, maybe in this corner of this line, all of a sudden you're piling in, you're in your own coherency, you're within three inches, but you're not in base to base. You're not, you don't even have to get your attacks in. You can just be, you know, 2.9 inches away. And now you're in combat with that unit. And if you hit them at the right angle, they if they want to do anything they got to move three inches towards it one to maybe three units are going to be able to fight and not kill your dog unit and now they're stuck the only other thing i'll add to that because that was very ex extensive is you can avoid roar and stomp in addition to all of what you just said because you oh cause yeah the outside yeah because you'd be outside of three so yes. you know yeah so and uh, and I'm, unleash and only shot. Yep. Yep. Another good point because yeah. you're not charging. So again, that's why this is a, gr a great benefit. So I like it. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. I love some of the nuance and techiness that you got in here. Mm -hmm. 
The second one is a Legion of Blood list. So Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, which is the General, Doom Minions, Death Lance, Cloak of Mists and Shadows, Flaming Weapon, and Vile Transference. How is he getting a second spell, you might ask? You've gone with Commanding Entourage Magnificent, which is an extra enhancement, which you've chosen as a spell. Just for anyone, I've had this a couple of times, asking how you get two spells. Um, you've got Neferata with Fading Vigor and Waste Away, the White King on, on Steed, and a Vampire Lord on Foot, three units of uh, Black Knights, a unit of Dire Wolves, and a unit of Grave Guard. So your Battle Regiment and Commanding Entourage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, this one, I'm, uh, I've been workshopping a little bit more than other lists that I have right now. Um, and I'm... There's very little fat that I found in this list that I feel I need to change. Um, the only thing that I found is maybe swapping out the Dire Wolves and maybe swapping out the Grave Guard. But if that happens, then it's a cascading effect of the Vampire Lord getting removed as well. So I'm just kind of moving a few things around, seeing how I feel, because the book is just so new. Um, but, you know, with this list, uh, it's really important, especially if uh, your, your listeners are, you know, listening to this and not watching this they can just pull up all the missions in the season and they can look at the territories and then they can look back at this list and then look at the territories again um in the missions and you can see the usefulness that comes here with the zombie dragon and neferata uh, in combo with each other because of the fact that like i said before three units or neferata and three other units can be removed from the table and brought back onto the table anywhere in their territory of course, that's not going to be relevant in some missions, but especially the missions where you have a 50-50 territory. Neferata, mm -hmm. who moves 16 inches, Zombie Dragon, who moves 14 inches, are now going to be 9 inches away from the opponent. So if you win priority, or if you have a pretty good idea that your opponent's probably going to give you turn 1, which, frankly, they're probably going to do that once, and they're never going to do that again, <laughs> um, then you will want to be you know in a good position and even beyond that there are some missions where your territory there's no man's land and there's both of our territories kind of like the corner ones and you have to be outside of nine inches from an objective now you're on the objective and you're scoring the objective before the game begins and so there's a lot of usefulness with neferata's uh, more darker blood ability in this list um i would Almost, always, I mean, I would never put Grave Guard on the table. I, I'm very, I'm a very big fan of literally always never putting them on the, on the table at the start of the game. Always in the grave. Just got to do it. Um, but you also might want to do that with all of the Black Knights and the White King even. You know, you might want to just start this list with the Zombie Dragon, Neferata, um, uh, maybe a unit of white uh, of uh, Black Knights and the uh, Vampire Lord and the Dire Wolves on the table. Like, you're going to want to really, really think about how you plan to like move in this game or in, in, in this list. Like you should have a good idea as to what your kind of general direction is going to be. And it's a lot less complex strategically than the Vier Coast list because it's very much like a cool, I'm going to hit you super hard. And e even if you don't want to go into the techiness of, uh, say, grave sites, the Black Knights, the Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon, a lot of this stuff has speed. Like, they're fast-moving units for death. So even if you don't want to go in, because I've seen a lot of Grave Guard fail their charge uh, from a grave site, and it always makes me nervous because, like, if you fail it and you fail the reroll, then the Grave Guard's just sitting there, possibly double-turned, um, shot off the board if your army's a shooting army. Um so for me, it's always like this risky piece, but you've got the speed anyway to kind of handle and control the board. So um, I, I really like some of these options. Yeah, and frankly, I had a variation of this list which dropped the Grave Guard and the Vampire, or no, dropped the Grave Guard, and I had more Black Knights and twenty Skeletons as well. So that could definitely have some some leeway there. But being able to have um, the Black Knights who do move twelve, you are right. Um, being able to alt charge in, let's say hypothetically, the 10 man and one of the five man got charges off and you protected your, um, uh, let's say you're going up against a Luminous list or some really, really shooting army that you knew your, your uh, white king was probably going to die to. Um, you keep them in the grave, you pop them up, you perform the uh, generic ability of the reroll charges, 
And their charges, not only do they get those reroll charges like we talked about before, but also, you know, as mentioned, their impact hits are very unique. Um, the equivalent uh, kind of unit, the the hex wraiths for Night Haunt, it's just two up no matter how many models are in the unit, one dice, two up, D3 mortal wounds. For these guys, it's uh, you roll two dice for each model existing in the unit. And on a five up, uh, an enemy unit takes that many mortal wounds. So if it's a five man unit, you roll 10 dice. If it's a, tw- a 10 man unit, you roll 20 dice. If it's a seven, you roll 14, et cetera. Um, when those are going on, on going off on four ups, that means that you're having a 50% chance of causing mortal wounds for each one. So you're doing 10 mortal wounds in, on average if yeah. the 10 man unit is charging into something. So they could easily kill the thing they charged on the charge and then pile into something that they might want to actually get into combat with. The cool thing as well, folks, just for anyone who's um, who's thinking about this list or I, any of the lists, is that these are just examples, right? It's not like, please take this list and run it at your next GT. Oh, yeah. But, let, but let's say hypothetically you drop the Grave Guard or you want to swap it out for something else. You might bring Kato in instead of the Vampire Lord. The Kato is a great model, but it's not a, a buff piece like the Vampire Lord. There's so many things you can tweak and modify here to make it your own. You know, you could take this list, swap out Neferata, and make this a Castellite list. Uh, obviously, to a you know to to a degree, but like, there's a lot of flexibility. Yeah. Maybe you probably wouldn't make it a Castellite. Let's be honest. Nobody's no, making Castellite. No. But you know, you could <laughs> sorry. Too. You could swap the Grave Guard. You could you could remove the Vampire Lord for some something else, maybe like Kato. Then you could swap the Grave Guard for a Mortis Engine. And a Mortis Engine is um we haven't even talked about it. It's great against um a lot of things. N- new gets like all the buff characters that are four or five wounds. If you do Spirit Gale and you roll that nine up and everything takes two wounds, and then you throw this Mortis Engine up, you might be popping several characters just right then and there. Yeah. There's, um, that, that's the cool thing. There's a lot of a lot of combinations um, and, and a lot of cool things you can do and build around. Mm-hmm. I've got a couple of rapid fire questions that I want to ask from Discord, sure. and then we'll kind of close it out. Um, so, um, one question around Soul Black Grave Lords uh, Legion of Blood: Is it better to swarm objectives like Fear Cross, or do more of a Death Star approach with the Grave Guard? Ooh, you know what? Uh, I think that really depends on the person's flavor. Um, I personally like playing a little bit of both. I, and I've, I've run lists that are both. Um, I kind of lean towards the, you know, Grave Guard, but I don't treat them like a Death Star because they're such a glass hammer. It's the, the previous Death Star was, was, was Blood Knight. So I would probably lean towards the latter idea that you had but make sure that you have kind of protections in place for it. How much do we prefer gravesite deep strike for objective control versus preparing for a turn one alpha strike? How does a sub faction influence, uh, let's say for example, the uh, Avangori um, who might have a bit more like alpha strike positioning pressure? Hmm. So they're asking what, um, uh, how often you would put something in the grave versus not the grave, basically. Yeah. So I, I guess, I guess, if I'm thinking about what the question's asking, so you've got your grave sites, you can put summonable units in the grave sites. Are you thinking about it more for objective control, like popping up onto objective, mm-hmm. having bodies, mm-hmm. and using the movement, or are you thinking about grave sites more for popping out of the grave, like you talked about the grave guard, and then going for that charge and and using it to to make an easier charge yeah uh i would say why not both um you can have both of those things happen there are no restrictions on what you can put from the gravesite and how many things you can take out of the gravesite at any one time and that's something that's really really useful to be aware of um there used to be restrictions in say legion to the gas for example um so having the ability to have the objective scores pop off from the gravesite and also have your offensive punch in that same fashion kind of come up from the graves at the exact same time can put pressure on your opponent in both areas. You know, you can have a 10 man unit of skeletons that are on an objective from a gravesite and then also nine inches away from a unit 
and have the reroll charge buff from say Radicar or something. And now your opponent's kind of going, well, crap. Not only did they take the objective that I'm I wanted to be on, but now they're covering it with something that is a huge threat to me. Even if they don't make the charge, now they're kind of insulating that small weaker unit with something a lot stronger. And that's my best case scenario. My worst case scenario is now that unit is in my face, tying my stuff in, and they're hitting me very hard. So um I would say, honestly, both. But it really depends on your opponent and the matchup and the mission. Yes, a thousand percent. thousand yeah. percent. It, it, there is no silver bullet to that answer, but mm-hmm. um, think about them both and what, obviously, the, the best situation... And it depends as well. Like, am I bringing up 60 zombies, 20 grave guard? Am I bringing up <laughs> yeah. entire wolves? Like, the, the units and then, like, you know, the grave guard and the, you know, like, what, what have you got and... Um, are you going first? Are you going to go second? Like, do you even have that choice of going first or going second? Like, but th- there's enough to get you started. Uh, mm-hmm. A couple of other rapid fire questions would be: um, Where is a tipping point for Black Knights needing a White King on Steed? So, if I just took five uh, Black Black Knights, is that do I should I be taking a White King on on Steed, or is it if I'm investing more into into them? Uh, yeah, it would depend on the number of units. I think. Uh, and also, yeah, how reinforced they are. Um, if you have one single five-man unit of Black Knights, you might not need a White King. If you have any more than that, get a White King on Steed. Yeah, I think a White, a white King on Steed and 10 Black Knights is is the party. Like, that's that's how mm-hmm. I'd be doing it. I've already seen people, and I know of people, and they know who they are, who are already trying to build, like, 15, 20-man units. Uh, no, it has to be only 15-man units, I think. Uh, yeah. Unless it's Legion of Blood. Yeah. Um, and still, like, yeah, the 15-man unit seems, like, really insane, but that's too many eggs in one basket. So 10's, 10's perfect. I can't remember what tournament it was. I saw a tournament where someone literally had, like, 2,000 points of Black Knights and, like, a couple of White King on Steeds. Like, it was literally, it was like Bretonia of um, <laughs> of, of, Le- of, of, of Nagash. Like, it was, sure it was literally... It Oh, like it was incredible. Like just, just all the calf, all the calf. Wow. Wow. Okay. Thoughts on, I think we've already touched on this. Like you might want to just give a quick overview, but the sons of the, sorry, the, the thoughts on the sons of, uh, is it Velmorn? The, um, Velmorn? The, the king, the king. I think we talked a little already about the fact that he's, uh, he slaps. It's a bit of a grave guard type unit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's something really really helpful that we didn't talk about with them they have the ability to point and click to an enemy unit that they're in combat with and be like uh i am not gonna let you pile in and that is something that is super duper helpful in addition to that they can also be like i myself will not pile in and now i'm going to have a three up save so they um always benefit from being near their named character so kind of think of it as one big unit uh, in order to get the most out of it. But frankly, um, they are pretty helpful. When you think about them being essentially 85 points, uh, if you count the actual White King as being the same price as a normal White King. So just things to consider. You just don't have the ability to customize. But yeah. Yeah. Thoughts on the Askorgan True Blade? Ooh, yeah. Um I wish they were better. I wish they weren't. Yeah. I wish they weren't in that 180 range being a little too close in points to Blood Knights. You know, I know they're 50 points apart, you know, since Blood Knights are 230, but like they, I could see their uses and I could see somebody running a fluffy list in an Avangori for fluff reasons and lore reasons with Luca Vi, because she was one of them and do the whole thing. And, but none of it synergizes with each other well. And they're not summerable, and they're 180 points. And I personally just wouldn't run them. Um, if somebody wants to, I'm sure if they're in cover and they're properly buffed, they could be really strong. But yeah, I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> yeah, and I'm looking at the war scroll, and I think there's some interesting rules, but probably not interesting enough. Like, I think I'd rather just like the Crimson Court if I wanted this elite small unit body troops i don't know like yes. i look at it like it's all right like it's a four up strike last okay but there's a uh, potentially are going to fail that um 
subtract one from hit, hit and wound rolls by enemy monsters. Okay, but you've only got two wounds each on a four up save. I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think that uh, it's just, I would truly just do the Crimson Court or, I mean, if you're looking at the gangs and those kind of like secondary box sets, um, there's, you could make an argument for the Sepulchral Guard as well. I probably wouldn't do that. Um, but honestly, it would just be maybe the Crimson Court, if not Sons of Elmore, for sure. Yeah. And the Crimson Court gained a whole bunch of wounds. So um, that's a lot yeah. more attractive. They're three wounds each now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's pretty helpful. Yeah, it went from like one to three. So all of a sudden, <laughs> it just exploded with wounds. That's great. Yeah. Last question, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, coming from from Dave, the Vampire Lord in disguise. We kind of already touched this one, but we'll just reinforce it. With a Vangorian Lord being more designed uh, to go with a, a hero-less monster, do you plan to take it without a monster, or do you include to inc plan to include it with a, de a design synergy? Yeah, so basically, are we, yeah, the Vangorian Lord. Are we taking it with a oh, with right. a a monster to synergize with it or is a Vangorian Lord the only monster you take? Uh, it really, for me, it just depends on if I'm playing it in Avangori. If I am playing it in Avangori, I will bring an extra monster. If I'm playing it in another list, I absolutely won't even bring it a, a generic monster. Those, those models are like, I mean, I personally don't like the models very much just because they're old, but they're, they're also 300 points for either one. If they're not conditional battle line and they're not um, going to add very much synergy besides just have, being near Vangorian, I personally am not going to run it. Um, so I am a big fan of uh, a Vangorian Lord still. I'm a really, really big fan of it in a Legion of Blood, having the three up ignore ward and it's minus one to rend uh, for using that as a buff for friendly units instead or ignoring the, the ethereal save and giving it the... Um, three up again uh, to do mortal wounds on spells instead um, because it's got that minus one to rend and then you do something uh, useful for it for its command trait and it's ignoring ward saves and it's four attacks with the talents ignoring wards in combat like Vingorian Lord's great yeah. but yes if you want I don't think it needs a um, a monster unless you're running at Vingori. Uh, yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I could see mm. it as a great alternative threat piece if you don't want to take a Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon. But, yeah, if I'm going in Avangori, it needs an extra monster. Without it, no, because then it's just too many points going into your list. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember, all the glow-up the Vangorian Lords have, they did not change in points at all. They've always been 280 points. And you've basically gotten them better in combat. They've lost the things that were bad about them. And then they got that one ability, which you could have if you bring a Terrorgeist or a Zombie Dragon, which you don't need to. No, no, exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Alex, Mr. G, this has been awesome. I think, again, we could have talked forever. This book yeah. is so deep. <laughs> like, we haven't talked about like zombies. We haven't talked mm -hmm. about so much in this book. But this will be part one of many videos. Um, I will have other guests. We'll talk about different parts of this book. Um, is there any final thoughts you want to share about this and, and then give some shout outs to your homies, the Corsairs? Um, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, you're going to want to look at a lot of different units in this book. Um, there are so many. Um, I'm having a lot of fun just testing them out. Mortis Engine's very good. Um, don't be afraid to run meme lists and just spam the same thing. Run 120 direwolves if you want. It'll be a nightmare. But if you want to run it, do it. Uh, um, you know, uh, Blood Knights are still good. They're still very, very good. We just didn't talk about them here, which I think is good because it's such an obvious thing to talk about. Um, you know, shout out to Jeremy for doing very well at Sparkle Blood Death Knights. Party with this. Blood yeah, Blood Knights. Knights. All right, I'm not gonna I'm gonna look, I'm not gonna let you go until you talk about yeah. this because a lot of people were upset with Blood Knights because they lost some movement shenanigans and they were hoping for some coherency things like the Chaos Knights where they can fight in two ranks. And then yes, they gain some extra uh range on the Lance attacks, but yes. From everything I've seen, people have poo-pooed the Blood Knights. They're like, oh, they've gotten worse. You know, I don't think that they've... I mean, they did go up 30 points, right? And that's something to, to consider. Um, the extra range with the Lances, always helpful. Or the, the 
uh, lances or blades. There are two rend natty, which is very, very helpful. Um, and, you know, they still have all their re regular command uh, abilities. I mean, uh, command model abilities. Um, and they're still plus one. Uh, they're plus one or two damage basically on the charge. But for me, the writers are ruined. At first, when I, when I read them, I was pretty bummed out. The writers are ruined being able to remove that kind of not official, but basically retreat and charge was a huge, huge thing that was disappointing to me. Um, but it does say models in this unit can pass across models. The wound characteristic of three or less as though it has fly and after it's moved, you can roll and, and they can suffer mortal wounds. So um, it can pass across things um, in any time that it makes a move. So that could be a charge move, that could be a mo uh, move move, that could be a retreat move, that could be a pile-in move, you know? So you have the ability to do a bunch of two up D3 mortal wounds in multiple instances of the game, not just the movement phase and then also retreat and charge. So you could potentially move up, charge. Um, you, you could potentially move up and do mortal wounds, charge and do mortal wounds, pile in and do mortal wounds. So I uh -huh. I think that that's pretty useful. It's just now it's a slightly different tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just just from what I've seen, people have just been upset with the Blood Knight changes. I think maybe people expected sure. too much from Blood Knights. They're like, maybe they wanted them as their Varen God or something. I don't know. Thousand percent. No, you're completely correct on that. I feel like every, and that's the reason why I don't run them too, is because it seems like too obvious of like a choice. And because like then you're relying on good saves in an army that predominantly does not have good saves. You know. By the way, if they were a unit of Varen God, if they were like Vampire Varen God, sign me up. Sign oh, me well, up. I've been waiting for foot vampire units, like blood knights on foot. I've been waiting for those. I don't know what, when that's going to happen, if it's ever going to happen. Is there anything you want to you want to say before we kind of, uh, or you want to give some shout outs to the homies? Um, yeah, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, my, my team, Corsairs, we're a West Coast team primarily. We're all over the place, though. Have a lot of fun. Um, hang out with us. Uh, get some drinks with us. We're always a good time. And uh, yeah, we, uh, or, uh, you know, if anyone wants to, uh, you know, hit the Corsairs up, we are on Twitter. You see my handle over here too, if you want to ask me any questions as well. Um, not always the fastest to respond, but um, I generally do. So yeah, um, if you have any questions, let me know. I can confirm as well, because we did actually go out for drinks and we had dinner. It was awesome. Uh, and I got to play next to you as well on and round three at LVO. You were on the table next to me against uh, oh, Mr. Barker. Yeah. Mr. Barker. And I played against a teammate. Oh, yeah. yeah. That it. was tight. That was tight. I was laughing my ass off with a Seraphon guy called, his name was Anthony, and we were laughing our ass off at each other. And you two uh. were having like the, the most top table game I've ever seen. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was fun it was a fun time uh i wish you were there for the did you you didn't play in the doubles did you no because i was hanging around i was like watching the stream i was getting involved on the stream i was i i didn't want to play because i wanted to enjoy just chatting okay okay because that was a great experience as well but yeah no it was always a good time alex I'm so glad you joined me again. Um, thank you so much. People, uh, go follow Alex, but also let me know in the comment section what you're thinking. Let me know what we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about the Coven Throne. We didn't talk about the Mortis Engine. We didn't talk no. about, like, there's so many things. Again, we'll be here forever. Uh, this yeah. is part one. We will go and find another discussion and we'll continue it. But thank you so much. Let me know in the comment section and go follow Alex on Twitter. Um, absolute legend. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spell cast.